Um, so let's talk about the village. And so when we talk about the village, there's actually several different uh, dyes that, that we can do. And I'm not gonna go into the history of that because again, there, there are a lot of videos that exist out there, um, both on YouTube as well as on my blog that talk about like when specific collections were released, including the village. This one's really gonna focus on tips and tricks. But when I refer to the village, I think of different things. First of all, we have the Paper Village and we have Paper Village 1 and 2. So this was Paper Village 1. Uh, this came out last year. We did Paper Village 2 and this came out this year. These are much smaller. They're these tiny uh, little houses. This is a, a great, I would say even a, a starter set. I love the idea of these Paper Villages because they are very easy uh, to create because it's really uh, two halves of, of walls and a rooftop right but once you understand how a house goes together this set which is the new village collection uh, that we launched last month this actually um, makes a little bit more sense so the village collection that's this big kind of massive uh, die set right 87 piece die set that was inspired by the original village dies that used to be steel rule dies and again there's a whole separate uh, live and launch for this that goes more into detail so we're going to focus on a little bit of both kind of crossing over i'm, I'm going to go more into this one <clears throat> simply because this is a bit more complex as you can see there's a lot of pieces so a shout out to zoe hillman if you guys have this die set okay the first thing you're going to want to do <laughs> first thing you want to do is move these little houses that i keep knocking over all right the first thing you're going to want to do is get them organized in some fashion because they all come in little pieces, right? Little envelopes. And Zoe Hillman created this very cool concept for organizing and she shared all the details on her blog. Uh, and I know Zoe's watching so Zoe can, uh, can post a, a, a link to her blog to iGirlZoe. But this is very cool because these are all on magnet sheets. But what's most important about uh, the idea that she had to organize these, because my other ones, like the Paper Village, they're small, right? Everything for this die set is on one magnet sheet, right? We talked about magnet sheets. These are vent covers that I like to use, but that's all on one. When it comes to this, this entire collection, there are so many components and you kind of don't know what's what. And so this has really been helpful to know that like these are the pieces for house one. This is going to be for house two. Uh, these are going to be your rooftops and she really shares how she labeled these these are all the manor pieces these are the ones for the towers or the addition or the spire or the awnings uh, even down to uh, door openings and entries and frames and chimneys and of course all the window frames this of course is going to be in my opinion the most impactful part of making the village that you don't have to spend time going in and looking and looking and looking for every little piece right so get them if you if you don't want to uh, get the extra envelopes and you have some other way of organizing that's fine whatever your way of organizing is is fine but organize them even if you have them uh, stuck onto a piece of of cardstock or chipboard for the making season because it is going to definitely help you if you're going to be building the houses right so that's going to be most important getting organized with your dies Okay, because if you just work out of a big pile each time, it's just going to take so much time to do it. And I agree. Um, this, has, this has changed everything. I mean, I will say that, uh, and I, I mean, I, I'm not going to lie. I prep every night before the live. So I started doing my prep last night, and this was a lifesaver, knowing exactly what I wanted to, to take and prep. And it also sparked some ideas, honestly, some new ideas that I did that. And I'm like, hmm, this is pretty cool. Um, so I think that that that's the, that's the most important factor. The second thing when it comes to building a, a village, whether you're gonna do, and when I talk about that, just so you guys know for the sake of the live, so I don't have to keep jumping back and forth. When I talk about the village, what I'm going to share today can be utilized for the village collection, that's this, or paper village. Because what we did when we reimagined this village collection is we took what we learned in paper village. So as far as the tabs and the score lines and crease lines, all of that, it's incorporated into both sets. It's really just a matter of scale. And obviously uh, this collection, you can do quite a bit more, right? But when it comes to surfaces, I prefer to work with something heavy. Now there's people that just work with regular paper. That's totally fine. Uh, again, you need to do what's gonna work best for you. But this would be my paper of choice when it comes to building 
the Village, only because it is a heavyweight stock. This is 130 pound. Now, if that's gonna be too, too heavy, right? If 130 pound is just too heavy for you to work with, well, use something thinner. Uh, but heavy stock from Ranger, we have it in craft. It also comes in white. So if you don't want it to be um, brown, if you want your houses, you can do white. So if you're gonna do any painting or any inking like that, you can do either one. This is 130 pound. And this to me is a really nice weight because you can see it's still flexible. It's still pliable. It's not chipboard at all, but it's a very rigid paper. And what I like about that is that when you're folding and creasing and doing all that, I feel that I'm building a structure that is doable, right? It's not too challenging because this is only a crease guide in here, right? This isn't going to cut in to help you score something very, very thick, but the thicker the paper, the more pressure. And so I do think that if you have 130 pound, it does make the score lines easier. Of course, if you don't want to work with something that thick, you can work with something thinner, right? These are both thinner. The, the mixed media heavy stock is actually thinner than either one of these and watercolor. And usually depending on if you go into a store um, or if you shop online, you can read the description. It'll always tell you the weight. So like wa the distress watercolor 118, right? 118 mixed media, 110. So this is thinner than this. And these are both thinner than these. These are both 130. Okay. So that would be kind of my first, um, Thing when it comes to getting your your supplies ready is having the right kind of paper if you work with regular cardstock and you're like hey tim i've used regular cardstock and it works for me fantastic okay that is that's good next thing of course is is how you want to to utilize your things some people like to prep from start to finish some people want to build one house at a time that's fine. We're going to just take it slow and just go in and talk about the main construction. I'll die cut a piece just to show you how I uh, kind of would lay out to do. I'll focus on one of the houses because in the collection, there are two different, say, building types. There's going to be the regular dwelling, which is kind of this little squatty house. And what was referred to as the brownstone, which is this tall house. The nice thing about uh, either one, of course, is that you can change the position. Now, this particular one uh, has this front part as the as the the die design so if you have your house this way you don't have to put this on you can actually cut this off and just add another roof piece and cover it up like with your shingles so you can put your door on this side if you wanted to but on this particular one of course you can use either side just because of how the roof is designed where you can have your door on this side or of course on this side and you can do tall doors skinny doors we'll get into all of the entryways okay all right now, when it comes to working uh, with the dies, I am one that likes to build the house and then actually go in and texturize the house, do the detail, right? And so uh, whether that detail, this is one that I shared for Halloween, whether that is going to be wood grain, I know people have done their houses out of brick or anything like that. I still am a fan of building the house first and then going in with texture, whether that's going to be uh, cobblestone or wood or brick. Now I keep both of my folders in the same envelope. You can see my, my envelopes are kind of bursting at the seams. Um, so the minis for each one of these, I have them in there. So I have the regular cobblestone and then this is the mini cobblestone that we did for the collection. The scale is smaller, which is going to mean that uh, when you put say rock or brick on these houses, it's more into scale. So I put that just because I like to save the packaging uh, and put it in the envelope. You can see that because the envelope is not the right size, right? They're too small. I just take a standard envelope, go into a scoring tool, and then just score it a little bit higher. I think maybe I go in, I don't know, maybe three quarters of an inch score and then create a new flap. I can tell you that uh, working on some bigger envelopes for next year, just because the embossing folders are quite challenging that they don't have an envelope to fit, right? But that's a, a whole nother process. And what's important to remember whenever you're making anything is that makes take time, right? So if you're looking for a quick make and you're not ready to, to put in the time to do it, this is probably not the kind of make for you because they do take time. But once you get into your building groove, they're very fun to make. And it's very easy to just do uh, repetitive work and you can create so many, way more than you would imagine, honestly, when it comes to, to working with that. I'm gonna start with this collection and then I'll show you some ideas at the end for these guys because these are very quick builds, but I wanna get into to kind of the meat of it, which is going to be this, this collection, right? So when it comes to die cutting, you're gonna cut out whatever it is that you want to, 
to create, whether it's going to be uh, house one, house two, I would form a plan, right? Decide what you want to create. You can go on to the website as well as the packaging, right? When you, when you buy this in the package, there's going to be all the different uh, inside is going to show you all the different kind of components or pieces that you get. The reason that they are brown and white is because brown is showing you kind of the basic building. And then down here, it's showing you the other pieces that you would put on each additional base. So that's why we kind of changed it white, just to show like, oh, that's how you put the tower on. Oh, that's how you put the addition or the entryway or any of that. Okay, just, just for ease that way. When I start, I like to take my craft stock and cut it in half. So I'm gonna take an eight and a half by 11 and I chop it in half. That's what I do. Some people don't like to do that. Some people want to go in and, and chop out your paper. Again, you do you. Don't, don't judge on the, on the paper. That just makes it easy for me because I can just get all of my craft stock cut. The reason I like to do that is it's pretty close to a cutting pad, what's gonna go in the machine. So this is going to allow me to yield a lot of space. It doesn't necessarily mean I fill it every time, but it's going to just allow me to I don't know, kind of yield the space. So we're gonna focus on house one. So I know I'm gonna need my house one pieces. I'm gonna need a roof for house one, okay? I'm not gonna do any additions, anything fancy. I'm gonna to wanna to put a door. That's probably gonna be pretty important. I don't know if I wanna get into the shutters or entryways or door frames. I don't even know if I'm gonna do a chimney at this point for the demo, but I'll probably wanna put some additional windows. It is important when you're sorting these that you look to see the difference between a window and a window frame. Okay, so when you're working with this, taking a look at, at the windows, the windows are just gonna have these cut pieces, right? That, this is what's going to cut out, say, the hole, the actual opening, okay? The little holes that you can see through. The window frames you're gonna see have a channel, and the channel, that's what's going to cut the actual frame piece that will fit over the window, okay? If you use this to cut out a window, it's actually gonna cut the entire thing out as one giant hole. Nothing will stay connected to your house. So it is important that you separate these two. Otherwise, when you place this through, you're just gonna have a bunch of skylights through your walls. Probably not what you're going for, okay? So definitely sort the difference between the windows and the window frames. These do not have an outer channel. These have an outer channel, okay? That's gonna be your difference between a window and a window frame, all right? So we'll, we'll want to know that, okay? Then when we start cutting things out, okay, you're going to work on your, on your cutting pad. I like to build on the cutting pad simply because uh, it makes it easier. So this is just gonna be a standard cutting pad for my machine. Again, I work with uh, Sizzix machines. If you have different machines, you have to kind of figure out what's going to work for you. I'm also going to work with sticky grid. Now, sticky grid is really important because the sticky grid is going to uh, be almost like this really low-tech double stick that's going to hold things in place. It was designed that you can use any of your alphanumerics to position your dies, and then when you cut it out, everything stays in position so you don't have to worry about washi tape or your dies shifting, okay? Sticky grid you can actually use again and again and again until it's no longer sticky, and then, well, you don't. <laughs> Monica said you had many skylights. So did I, really. Honestly, before, um, before I got this, and, and Zoe sent me her organized set, which was so sweet. Before I had things organized, I would just be in such a rush that I wouldn't even pay attention to that channel. And then I would cut, I'm like, ah, oh, dang, right? Serious, uh, serious skylight. So sticky grid, you're gonna notice when you peel this off that one side of the sticky grid is going to be a little, oh, I'm just gonna say stickier than others, but there is no right or wrong. So it's just kind of luck of the draw, whichever one you peel off first. Then you're gonna take that. I prefer to have a, a sacrificial cutting pad. I have one cutting pad that I use for sticky grid all the time because it does get, you can kind of see that little adhesive buildup. It does get that on there. So that's just what I do for choice. But you can, again, do what you want. If you try to use sticky grid on a cutting pad that's really chopped up, this one's not too bad. But if you have a cutting pad that's really chopped up and you're like, oh, I'll use that as a bottom one. I'll use my sticky grid. It's not gonna wanna stick to it very well because it doesn't have a smooth surface to stick on. So at the end of the day, you think you're, you're kind of saving it by reusing that cutting pad, but you're trashing it. And honestly, I, I don't understand the stigma with cutting pads where people think that these are like the everlasting gobstopper and that a plastic cutting pad is supposed to last you your crafting career. That just doesn't happen. This is just a, a tool that's designed. It's no different like Mario talks about a cutting board in your kitchen, right? You have it, 
you're going to cut on it. You're going to make a, a bunch of lines. It's going to get uh, stained. It's going to do all sorts of things and then you replace it. So that's the thing about cutting pads as well. They're just meant for that because not only are we talking about the marks or even warping that people have an issue with, but because this is made out of a certain type of plastic that is designed to not only provide rigidity, right? Because we need it to go through the machine to provide pressure, but it has to be soft enough to allow the blade to cut into it to get the right pressure. Even if you've used these and they get kind of warped and you're like, oh, I'm gonna flatten it out because it's gonna work well. Once this thickness minimizes, you have now impacted the pressure. So it's not even gonna cut well anymore. Even if, it, even if it's flat as a board, uh, eventually it's just not gonna cut as well because not only is it all marked up, but the, the thickness of a cutting pad has become kind of compacted over use. That's just what it is. So keep that in mind, right? Do I save these release papers? Sometimes I do, because you see one comes off pretty good and one comes off in a curly cue. So I, I normally save this one because then when I'm done with my, my sticky, I'll normally cover it up, right? I only put a fresh one on for the sake of the demo, but normally I just keep one on there and I'll take that piece of paper, there's no right or wrong, and I put that on there and that's how I store it until I need to replace it. And you'll see when you do that, one's gonna come off really good and one is just gonna come off like this. It is what it is. Okay, so when we go to position the house and, and your dies of how you want to, to cut things out, that's really gonna be up to you as to what you're going for, that's all I can say, what you're going for. I'm going for a house, okay? So I know that when I'm going to, to cut this out, I wanna to try to cut the entire house out in one pass. If you don't wanna do that, you don't have to. Sometimes people get, they get a little carried away when they're working because they want, you know, 50 window cutouts in their house. They wanna kind of build this mansion, whatever, that's fine. But on the dies, you're only getting two of the same window usually, right? Except for this one, because this is designed for the bell tower, but that could also be used for a church so you can get two side windows, but usually it's that. And I'm saying that because if you want two windows like side by side, well, you're only gonna have two unless you wanna change your windows, right? When you're placing this down on the sticky grid, we're placing the dies smooth side down, okay? Now, now that I'm talking about that, I'll also mention that these these little markings right here where Zoe's got house one and we talk about window frames and all that, that's actually etched on each die, right? What component it is. So in addition to organizing, this also helps you know what is what, right? There, let me try to get that to focus. There we go, see that little house one? So there is markings on the die, but it's, it is so much easier just to kind of go in and, and just figure it out and have it already organized. All right, so when I lay them on the sticky grid, I'm laying them flat side down, blade side up, but here's what I wanna do. Depending on what you wanna put on your house, I know that usually I'm gonna put windows on the side. And because this is a grid, I like to take my die and I'll line up one of the edge on the grid and this point I'll also put on a grid line. Do I care about inches, measurements, all that? I really don't. I don't really care about any of the numbers on there. I'm not that much of a, of a measure, but I like the fact that I can position the die on the grid to know that it's that I've got like a centering mark and to also know that my die is going to be somewhat straight, right? Once it's there, then I'll just give it a little thump just to help stick that down. I'm gonna do the same thing over here, right? So it doesn't matter. The only thing that matters when you're placing this on your, your sticky grid is that you never want your dies to touch or overlap. That would be bad. Right? If you're trying to save space and you have your die actually overlap, you will destroy your die on your first pass, okay? So really important to, to kind of remember that when you're working. So I've got those two sides of the house. This is going to be that little entryway, right? For house one, because house one has that. So I'm gonna place that down as well. And I'm just utilizing the whole space because I know that my paper is relatively the same size. If you go too far out to the outer, the outer banks of your cutting pad, well, then you're not gonna be able to use a half a sheet of paper. So kind of keep things into the middle, don't go all the way to the edge. And another thing, I don't like to have my dies right on the edge of a cutting pad, right? I don't like to put them right in, I like a little head start. That allows the rollers of the machine to engage a little bit easier, okay? So if you, if you can try to avoid putting your dies right up to the edge, I think you'll be much happier that way. All right, then we need the roof. So we're gonna do the roof for house one. That's the one that's got that little notch because we have this little entryway here. Okay, but again, the back of the die is gonna tell you, 
pick and focus. There we go. House one right there. So, you know, and I'll position this down. So the cool thing about this particular layout, I've done this house so many times is that I can cut house one as far as the walls, the roof and the, the overhang in one pass. Okay. You can't necessarily do that with the brownstone because it's too big, right? That taller house is too big, but this one seems to work pretty well. So once you have this down, you don't want to get ahead of yourself because this is where you just, you're just starting to feel good, right? It's like you solved the, you solved the Rubik's cube here. You were able to put this down and you're like, whoop, whoop, I got down. I want, I want to cut. I want to go. Well, we don't have any doors or windows yet. So if you cut it, you're going to have to go and cut it a second time to get the stuff in. So now is where we want to put in our doors and windows. This particular house, okay, this is the one that we're cutting. It's got that little peak right there. That's going to be the front of the house for me because I want that, or it could be a back porch if you wanted it to. Again, you do what you want to do. But I'm going to choose an entryway, right? A little doorway. This is nice because it already has the doors and windows spaced out. So you don't have to worry about, oh, I'm going to put this here, I'm going to put this here, I'm going to put this here. The other benefit is that these doorway dies actually have one side that doesn't have a blade instead it has a crease so it will allow for a little hinged door okay so you're just going to choose which one you want to do we'll just do this one good old standard okay and then i'm going to place this down inside here now when you place this down on your sticky grid again remember that whole overlap thing that i told you about you do not want to rest it on the die because we have an overlap that would be bad you want to rest it against the inside edge of that now you'll also notice that the sides because it's all about spec this width is not the same as this width so we're going to use this as our centering mark and that's only if you want your doorway to be somewhat centered just kind of eyeball it so i just i set it down i rest it against the the edge of the inside of the die and then i drop this down now if you have fingernails well good on you if you don't i don't um, you want to be careful because if you try to like move it by shoving the, your fingernail under there, it's not a very comfortable feeling. Um, so one thing I like to take is you can take a die pick. A die pick is just good to help you kind of move. I just put it inside somewhere and I'll just help drag it across. Once it's positioned, just kind of tap that down. We're good. Maybe I want to have some side windows. Okay. I'm going here, mm, windows. What do I want to do for my side windows? Okay, let's do our side windows of this one. I don't know, these big ones. So I'll just take both of these, slide these off of the magnet, and we're going to position these. Now, you can decide whether you want to have this kind of window. Maybe you also want to put a hole at the top, whatever you want to figure out. But the sticky grid is going to allow me to not only place it along that bottom edge, right? See how I can line that up. But I can also use the middle if I want to center this particular window if I'm going to just do one at a time if you're going to do different ones you can do different ones just I use my die pick and my finger to kind of make sure that it just doesn't go flying so there's the front and the side we're going to flip it over that's the other side and we'll position this so here I've got like two and an ish there's a two and an ish so that also I say ish because you should just measure to the nearest ish don't get so crazy when you're doing this that it, it takes you time right too much time then I'm going to position this there we go. Do you want windows in the back? Eh, sure. No, not going to, but you could, right? You could have windows all the way around. I technically don't because I'm usually, you know, putting this against something. Uh, but, you know, if you're going to have it on a Lazy Susan or you're going to have it on some mechanical spinner, knock yourself out, put windows everywhere. Okay. So there you go. That positions it. Then again, just take your finger and just thump that down. You want to make sure that those dies, even though you positioned them, we want to make sure that they're secure to the sticky grid. Sticky grid does last a long time. I'll be honest. I prefer um, a little less, <laughs> less sticky of a sticky grid. So I like it after it's been used a few times where it's not as sticky, but you got to start somewhere. Some people said, oh, put it on your shirt or your jeans or all that. I do not recommend that because you really lose a lot of the function of this sticky grid. But again, you do you. Then we're going to take our piece of paper. Now this is craft heavy stock. So it's just going to go right over the top. We're going to position this down. Okay. Now, depending on how you use sticky grid, if you didn't have a lot of dies on your surface, the nice thing about this is this will also hold your paper down. Okay. But because I have so much on there, pretty much my paper is going to want to slip inside. It's still going to be okay. It's just something you want to watch as you put it in the machine. I know that there's a little space there, so I'm just going to press that down. It still gives it, see it just like a little grab, 
but not too much, but enough. Okay, and we're ready to make a cut. So let me kind of move. I didn't didn't think this through on the the camera part, but I'll figure this out. How are we doing, Mario? Very good. Uh, and the only thing that I've seen so far with concern is people were asking about chimneys. I told them you'd get there. So sure, we'll do the chimney. Yeah, you want to see the chimney? We'll see the chimney. Okay. So next we're going to talk machine. Now, everyone, I don't want everyone to freak their freak, but I'll, I'll talk about machines, right? So you can use whatever machine you want to work with. There are a million machines out there. And as a maker who's been doing this for many, many years, there is not one machine that is the be all end all. Really? It's the same thing as like any other kind of utensil, appliance, any other craft tool. You have to do what's going to work for the job because people say all the time, well, like, what's the best machine? Well, it depends on what you're doing, right? I love my Vagabond. I still have my Vagabond. I actually have my original Vagabond, um, but that machine has been retired because we are launching a new um, electric machine. It was supposed to come out this year, but it's due out next year. But um, three years ago, Sizzix launched this machine. It's called the Foldaway, right? Uh, and they launch it in white. And when I saw this machine three years ago, honestly, from someone that only works with an electric machine, except for the sidekick, right? This little guy right here. I love my sidekick. Um, I, I used it and I'm like, oh my gosh, this machine is, is pretty unbelievable. Am I going to say it's the best machine ever? Well, no, because if you can't do a crank machine, it, it's pointless, right? You're going to want an electric machine. But I do love the fold away for the fact that this guy is so pressurized. It has more pressure than the Vagabond, probably like 25% more pressure as a machine. So it cuts very well. You don't necessarily need to use a precision base plate with this because it will cut detailed eyes. And on 3D embossing folders, it's usually one pass, right? You could do two passes, but a lot of times you can get by with a single pass on this machine on 3D folders because it's that much pressure. Now, this machine, this is coming out uh, early next year. It is launching though in, in select Joann stores for the holiday season. So it's already started uh, launching. This is, the only difference is that it's black because I like a, a black machine. But the cool thing about the fold away, and it's not really a machine kind of infomercial, but I like to use it for the holiday makes because as I mentioned before, when we talked about the sidekick uh, last week, this is all about creative convenience. And if you're gonna just be blazing through this and you have an electric machine that you like, go for it. But if you are looking for something that's going to be some quick cuts and has some great pressure for passes and you don't have a lot of space, that's what's really nice about this thing. It doesn't have a suction cup or anything. It just sits there. It's pretty sturdy, but it's got a metal handle with this little latch. See this little button? So my handle is locked and it fits right in on either side. You push this button to open it up and it locks this way as well. So when you want to fold it back up, you push the button and it locks in this way. Okay. To open it, you simply just pull it apart. It doesn't have anything fancy. It doesn't have that opening thing like the Vagabond. You just pull it open. It does have little storage compartments, right, that you can pop open. I'm not into all that. I don't want my machine to be a little rattle trap, so I don't like things rattling around in there, but both of these can open up. You'll see that it's got little icons, little locks with arrows. And so to, to engage the machine from flopping around, you simply, once it's open, take your hands, and you push this in. And it's a weird sensation when you first do it because you think you're breaking the machine because when you, when you want to fold it up, right? So see how like durable this is? When you want to fold it up, you have to pull these back out. There's little bumps under there and you have to pull that out and fold it up, right? So those little bumps kind of act as a, a finger grip. This is a pretty cool machine. So I'm gonna use that for just the sake of the demo. Again, you can use whatever you want to work on uh, with that. Yeah, I see some people say they have the fold away. Yeah, it's been out for, like I said, three years in white, and it's a really cool machine from a creative convenience and a pressure thing, all right? So I'm going to take my sandwich, and it comes with cutting pads, right? I designed mine a little different because I like to put a little caution tape on there to say, do not use this piece for embossing because I've destroyed so many different things when I'm doing embossing. But I've got my platform, my thin die adapter, and then we're going to just do the sandwich, right? I agree, Zoe, the pressure, it's crazy, crazy good. And another thing about pressure that you have to understand, it's not so much just detailed dies, it's also if you ever wanna load up your plate, right? So that's another reason why I like to use this when I'm, when I'm trying to do this maneuver, because there's a lot of cutting blade going through. Now, if you don't have a machine like this, no problem. If you try to run this through whatever machine you have and it's not cutting, 
just do a second pass. That's it. It's that simple. You can do a second pass, but you won't need to do it on this one. All right. So I'm going to place my paper down. All right. Putting this right on there, just kind of eyeballing that. I'm going to take a cutting pad. I'm going to put that over the top. Okay. So now I've got everything. I want to make sure that I don't have anything exposed. There you go. There you go. And we're just going to put this in. Now, when you go and use this, I'll try to get my, my camera centered. There we go. We're going to, of course, engage this first, right, into the roller. And then I like to stabilize by just holding. That's why it's got that little cush grip. Just hold that. And you're just going to give it a crank. You'll hear the little crackly bits. Ooh, that's a beautiful sound in the die cut world, right? Now to just turn that, flip that over, and there's all of our stuff. And so what's great is that, of course, everything has been cut, right? One pass, we can see that it's cut in there. And here are some of the cool things about this particular um, concept, right? So I like to just work on the platform. You can take it onto the table, it doesn't matter. All of these little pieces on a cutting pad, you're just gonna wanna get rid of those little pieces. You might wanna save those for other, other makes or something. But I carefully go in and pull off the paper. Can you see I'm doing that? Just going around the dies. And there's, there's a couple of reasons for that. If you plan on making more than one, right? And don't worry if this gets wrinkled, crinkled, it's still gonna stick down there. If you're gonna do more than one pass, it is nice because most of the time when you're working with it, let me find, usually this is what happens, I'm not alone, your die pick. This is where I'll just go in and start to lift off my paper using my die pick. So I'm kind of going around and just popping this off the sticky grid. All right. Oh, that was not a good pass. That was a shift. Do you guys see that? Look at that disaster. That was not good. So let me move this. <laughs> let me give that another pass. Because what happened is, look, see my door got a little shift. Not a good thing. Let's redo. The beauty of this, I know, and this is where people are like, he is human. Well, we're all human as makers, but I'm going to do a reset because I don't like, I don't like the fact that that shifted. So I'm just going to move this off. I'm not going to use another piece of sticky grid. I'm just going to pull this off and just stick that back down and we'll put these dies back. All right, because we want to have a nice clean cut. And if you don't have a clean cut, if your dies got, uh oh, that could be tragic. We'll see. We'll see what happens. This is good. All right, let me move this. Get this out. All right, I'm gonna put this back down. This should, I think what happens is this got pushed under there, but I don't think it's a, a train smash, but I'll tell you in a second after we go and run this through. I think that has to do with just the fact that I probably shoved that into the machine when I shouldn't have. All right, place this down, place this down, two, three. You still wanna make sure on your windows. Now, if you're a perfectionist and you have a little ruler handy, right? You can go there, you can go there. I'm not, like I told you, I like to measure to the nearest ish. That's gonna work for me. And we're gonna take our paper we're gonna put this back. Let me get these pieces out because I'm not even gonna use this. There you go. Anytime you're cutting, and I'll show you this in a second as well. If you have any little bits of paper that stay on your cutting pad, so let's say you had a little piece, I'm not sure if this is even gonna, we'll see what happens. Um, if you have any little bits of paper that remain here, you're gonna to wanna to remove any pieces of paper if you're gonna do a, a repeating cut because that could be bad. All right, let's try it. Let's see what's gonna happen, Mario. It's either gonna, it's, well, it, no, it's either gonna cut or I'm gonna open up that other pack of dies. Right, another thing to note when you're doing a cutting pad, can you see on just one cut how it has just a slight curve? It's not super bent, it's not banana mode, it's just a slight curve. Always rotate your pad. So if you see that it's got a, a curve going this way, I, I like to position that where I've got like almost the bubble side where it's gonna press it back down because if it, if it already has a curve and you keep going in, and doing that curve, it's gonna to continue to curl your cutting pad. So get in the habit of just taking that and flipping this over, right? Flip this around. Uh, position that, place this down. All right, how crazy is that, right? All those times that I've cut and then save it for live. Let's see how we do it. Rock and roll. Victorious.
All right. So when you take this off, we'll go back to our regularly scheduled program. If you plan on cutting many, many things, right? Try to keep your layout pretty consistent here, okay? Which means you can take your stuff because this is going to allow me to then put on another piece and another piece and another piece without having to reposition my dies each time, each and every time. If you don't care about that, like you're only gonna do one house and you go, then it doesn't really matter how you do the dismount. When you go to take your paper out of the dies, there's a couple of ways to do it. You could either poke into the paper. So if you know you're gonna cover something else, right? So let's say you're gonna do the rooftop and you're like, ah, I'm gonna cover it with roof tiles anyway. Well then, what does it matter, right? Just take your die pick, poke into that paper and pry that up, right? Because you're gonna cover it up anyway. But if it's going to be a wall that you don't plan on covering, so let's just take this. A lot of times I'll just go under the corner of the die right there, just with my die pick and just pry this up from the sticky grid. And that's just going to allow me to take the die pick, go across and pull off this panel. And again, when I pull this off, can you see how I've got my finger under there to hold the die? That's just what I do if I know I'm gonna reuse the layout. So option, pry under there, slide the die pick to release it from the uh, adhesive, the uh, sticky grid, and you're good to go. If you don't care, you can just rip the whole thing off. Now you've got things in the window. That's where the die pick comes in handy. You're just gonna go in, pick these pieces out. Easy enough. Done, okay? So this, you're gonna poke out the windows. Excellent. Now you can see the pressure of the fold away. This is what I was talking about. You see my crease lines, they're really, really deep. They're still not deep enough in my opinion. I'll show you some tricks on, on how we can fold that, but I've got my pieces. So what I like about this is that as I'm going, I'm going to continue this thing, right? If, if this is the house layout that I wanna do, I'm gonna to continue to cut my house set because essentially I've got both walls, my roof, and the front piece. I don't have any fancy accessories yet. I don't have a chimney or anything, but I have the basic. And this is what's going to allow me to then cut, go, cut, go, cut, go, because everything has stayed on there, okay? Because it was stuck down. If for whatever reason you pop something off, it doesn't matter. If you were really that much of a perfectionist where you're like, oh my gosh, my window, uh, you know, when I, when I took it out, my window went over here, okay? That's all right. You can still just take this and use it as some type of guide or template where you just kind of ish measure it and say, okay, I want to make more that looks like this. Lay it down, up, oh, pretty close, good placement. Off to the races you go, right? So just the, my whole thing about making is sometimes we just get so caught up in our heads that we freak our freak, right? Even like the die slipping, right? You would have done this and instead of just moving forward, it would have been a catastrophic meltdown. It would have been like, off to Google I go. What happens if the die, instead of just seeing if, if it really did anything wrong, which it didn't, right? Other than a, a little blemish there, it still works. So my point is when things happen, just kind of keep going. The whole idea of a maker is to, to figure it out. So once we have these pieces, what I like to do is get yourself some little bags, okay, it makes it easy, and just put that house in a little bag, right? This is, these are already prepped houses. This way they're, they're ready to go. When you wanna go in and do houses, you've got all these house pieces, just go, go, go. You can take that and go for it. If you, if, let's just say you wanna kinda of change things around. Let me take this out just to show you, okay? You can just do a basic and do the flat walls. And let's just say later you decide, oh, okay, I think I wanna put other windows in. You can still go back to this piece that has no windows. So let's just, let's reset for a moment. Let me get rid of this stuff. I don't wanna confuse you. But it's all about compartmental making. I'm just gonna pop these off with my die pick. If you are one that plans on making a ton of houses, because every maker is different, right? Sometimes we're just gonna make one, sometimes we're gonna make a bazillion, sometimes we wanna uh, have a craft party with our friends or kids or anything like that. So everyone's gonna be a little different. If you're going to just do one die, okay? I'll, I'm gonna actually position it this way because I'm only gonna work on one. I'll share some other tips. Because a lot of times when I'm in prep mode, right? Maybe this is during you know, television or whatever it is, and you don't wanna think about windows and you're not really sure yet, you don't wanna to commit to those you know, choices of how you're gonna remodel your home. Let me put this, there's a little bag. But you might have all your pieces, you're like, okay, now I've gotta figure out what I wanna do for my windows. Okay, well you can go into that die 
like, well, maybe we'll use these ones that we just had. We're like, okay, I'm gonna put windows in the back because I have this idea and I wanna have some light shining through. So I'm gonna take this, I'll go in, use my die pick, position those. Okay, just kind of figure that out. Excellent, all right. But I have, this is that house piece that I cut. The cool thing about this is that you can pop it right into there. And depending on how many dies, like if you, if you don't have a window on this side, you can totally utilize a sticky grid, right? But if you had a window, what I would suggest is popping this kind of right into its little channel and it should be fine to run through. You shouldn't need to tape anything, okay? Because it's going to be fine. And this is what's going to allow you to cut windows. So my point being is if you don't have any idea of how you want to cut your windows or doors and you just want to cut walls, just cut walls then one day and then you can go back is it a second step yes would i recommend it no i would recommend just committing like i showed you the first time and go for it but if you if you didn't it is nice or let's say you did that and you're like oh hey you know i'd like a little window there could i run this through again yes because the paper sits in to that channel there but this is the tip that i want to share with you in case this is kind of why you're working with it so let's say you wanted to run this through and you had all the sticky grid exposed. <laughs> you don't want that. What you're gonna wanna do is either take this piece of paper, right? And place it down. Then you would put your cutting pad and run this through, okay? Because otherwise you're gonna have so much sticky surface that your this cutting pad is gonna get some of that sticky on there. It's not a train smash, but it's kind of annoying because your cutting pads are gonna to wanna to pry off. If you don't, the other thing that you can do, Mark, right, can you just hand me a piece of that deli paper? I have a box of deli paper. I, I learned this, that deli paper is your friend from uh, Paula. Uh, use it for a lot of different things, but you can take deli paper, wax paper, anything that's gonna have a release and you would cover that sticky grid as well. So if you didn't save your release paper for whatever reason, do that. My point is, if you have all of this sticky grid exposed, you don't wanna run your cutting pad through, otherwise it's just gonna get kinda of gunky, in my opinion. Again, only my opinion, right? Okay, that's it. So I've got my die in place, there we go, sitting in that channel, just I'm gonna make sure it's in the channel because I kinda of see it popped out a little bit. I'm gonna place that in, move that around, and you can see, you'll be able to see the die all the way around. I've got that covered up, I've got that. Okay, let's cut some windows, move this in. It's a little tricky kind of doing this from, you know, you know how that is. Engage, hand, grip, turn. It's an easy turn. Don't freak out when you hear the little crunchy bit. Okay, but this way, see, cutting pad. So see, see that little stick? That's okay, but imagine if your entire cutting pad was that sticky. This peels off, nice. And then we're just gonna go in right under there First, I'd just like to pop that off. I'll take my die pick, just to see, just kind of loosen that from the sticky grid, and you just peel that off. And now you've got little openings in there, right? Totally up to you what you do. And some people, I mean, there's so many things that you can save these little pieces for. Um, I know like little tombstones, I think Zoe used some of these, you can use them for tombstones. If you were doing something cool for Halloween, you can use them as shingle pieces, you can use them. There's a lot of things that you can do with the cutouts if you want to save them. I am not that kind of maker. I just, I kind of move on to whatever's next. So that's gonna be the basic of, of the cut. But before I put this away, I'm gonna cut a chimney because I don't think I prepped a chimney. So who knew that's what it would be? All right, so before I do that, let me just set this off to the side real quick because I don't wanna get ahead of myself. I'm gonna put my panel pieces back in the little Ziploc. There you go. And I'm gonna take this and just put your pieces back. It is fun to create in chaos, but you have to remember to put your stuff away. It just makes the experience uh, better, right? Because sometimes I think if you just have too much stuff everywhere, I can't create like that in, in full chaos. I just can't. All right, let's put the roof back for house one. There we go. We've got these panel pieces for this house. See, it doesn't take long if you have these cool templates just to know where everything goes. Kind of position that. I've even seen some people kind of outline and draw and just figure out what goes where. But I'll show you some other things, all right? Um, these particular bags, I think, are three by four for that house. I have, 
Oh my gosh, if you saw the thing of bags that I have, I love to buy bags. Don't I, Mario? You do. Because I be, but I reuse them, so I'm not wasteful. Um, yeah, I have every size, two by three, four by four, four by three, five by seven. I have a, like a bag of bags. You can get them like on Amazon or Dollar Store. There's, yeah, there's a lot of places that you can just get. Oh yeah, craft store as well. Just, just Ziploc bags because it does help and yeah you reuse them so if you look over here i've got some other things like the spire already prepped the addition there's the brownstone because sometimes let's face it guys you don't feel like doing anything there's no shame in that sometimes you're just not feeling the make that day because you just don't have any ideas but you want to do something creative so creative prep that is part of that process there's there's really nothing wrong with that i think that where did this roof piece go and we got that, we have that, we have that. Um, that's the extra piece over there. There's nothing wrong with just sitting there saying, you know what, I don't really feel like going in and, and constructing or building anything, but I'm in my creative space, what can I do? Well, I think what you can do, you know what, I don't even need this machine for this. I'm gonna use my sidekick. Um, there we go, let's fold this away. I'll set this over here. Um, just getting some stuff prepped, that's, to me, that's full making mode already. All right, take that. Oh, <laughs> Mario's getting my, my box, of, box bags. of bags. I do. See, and I just have them labeled four by four, four by five, just because you never know what, what size bag you're going you're gonna to want for stuff. And when you, when you use it, right, when you take the stuff out of the bag, you just put the bags back and use them again. It's a great way for just making. I've, I've said it before, and I, I totally uh, live by what I like to share with you, is that compartmental thinking or making is very impactful to me because I get incredibly overwhelmed. I think it, it just probably has to do with um, my ADD, OCD. I've got everything. And um, I, I say like my creative brain is like, it's like a popcorn machine. And sometimes I just can't focus, but I want to make something I want to create. So just getting in that compartmental mode is very good because I still feel like I'm doing something that I'll I'll end up working with. All right, so I'm just gonna take my sidekick for that chimney piece just because we can. Is that the die? There we go. I'll take that little piece of paper. I've got my little sidekick. Could I have used the other one? Absolutely, it doesn't really matter, but this is just gonna be quick because it's small and it's gonna allow me to use some of that paper that I pulled out on, the, on that snafu earlier. So there's different chimneys. There's like double of the regular chimney. There's gonna be a taller chimney like a smokestack that you can use uh, in the manor. The cool thing about the chimneys, and I'll show you, and you can use these for all sorts of the different houses. See how you can stack them, right? The tall one fits inside of the short one. So you can kind of create that little stack if you want. We just wanted to give you a lot of different, uh, different opportunities. Some stuff we doubled. People have asked like, why, why did you duplicate this and not this? It really just depends on, on kind of what my mood was. Uh, that if there's space on a, on a template, I'm like, ooh, let's go ahead and stick that in. Let's do that that die in there, right? Uh, the chimneys like this one, this one's just a little bit uh, shorter than the other one. Not much, but just enough because it, that's how it fit on the template. Not everything has to be sticky grid mode, right? Sticky grid is when you don't want stuff to move around, but if you just want to work, you can still go in and you can either do cut side down or cut side up. Everyone has a different opinion. Some people go, oh, I like to do blade side up, paper side down and run through it. Other times I want to just place it there. There's no, in my opinion, there's no right or wrong. So just gonna cut this, make sure this is secure, uh, run this through, and we'll cut a little chimney so you guys can get a demo on that. Okay, the chimney's gonna cut two things. Gonna cut this little box and this little strip. Some people use both. Some people only like the little box, but I'll show you what we're gonna do with both of those, okay? And I'm gonna leave that die there. So you see every little scrap, it's never a catastrophe, right? Oh, that's another tip, like the dismount. If you work on a media mat and you're trying to take off the sidekick, even if you unloose, unloosen this, sometimes it's gonna have some good suction and you rip your, uh, your stuff off. If you've ever done that, you know exactly what I'm talking about. Um, the, the biggest challenge is that when I'm working with this, if I take this off, I just take it and give it a little twist and that just kind of, we'll see on this case, see, sometimes it doesn't wanna let go. And I saw someone asked about the chimney on Village 2. I'll get there when we do Paper Village. Just remember, remind me to do that and I'll talk about that. It's a very easy thing on that one, okay? All right, so this, I see my nice little 
crease line, so I'm not gonna need to keep out this die. Sometimes if I don't see my crease lines, I'll keep that out. Okay, so we have some pieces cut. Do we have enough stuff cut? I think so. I agree, sidekick is my best friend here. Everyone needs a sidekick. Right, Mario? Everyone needs a sidekick. Okay, not that you're a sidekick, but you get it. All right, so we have some pieces. I'm just gonna take, oh, let's take a house. Uh, this is where, it's, yeah, this is kind of where we kind of go off script, right? Oh, Paula says she's with Kath, but I don't know on what. Oh, because Kath, Kath said I, no, I could probably call myself a bad lady. Ah, there you go. All right. Oh, okay. So next, let's talk about the crease, the score. Depending on your paper, okay, this little line here is designed as a fold line, crease line, and the die does what it can do as far as a crease. But depending on your paper, sometimes it's just not enough. Okay, so it's completely up to you. Sometimes it's just not enough. Some people like to go in with uh, a bone folder or a paper creaser and they, they accent those lines. I find that something like this is too wide to do that. It creates just too big of a channel. So I use my remnant rub tool and I shared this probably last year, I think with the hack. I, I talk about this all the time. This is a tool from Ideology. It's just, it's metal. Okay, it's a metal tool. It's great for rub-ons. It's just a round ball stylus for rub-ons. And then it has this little sliver. This was like to get the back of the rub on off of your paper, right? That little release paper, cause I don't have any fingernails. So I needed to design a fingernail. I guess that's what that is, right? But because it's metal and it has that wonderful angle that is smooth, so it's not sharp, it is perfect for adding the score line. So what you wanna do is you're gonna hold the tool straight up, okay? You don't wanna angle it. You just wanna hold it straight up and you'll feel it fit right into that channel, okay? When it goes into the channel, you're simply going to draw the straight line. Let the tool stay in the track. Don't think about it. Because if you think about it and you're like, oh, I'm going to score it, you're going to go off the, off the rails here. The other thing, if you work on your mat, don't do it over here. Don't do it on your nonstick mat because you're going to leave marks in it. Work on the glass. So you just put it in the channel, go back and forth. So this is another thing that I'll just sit there, you know, maybe have some music going and just go in and just draw on your lines. How many times do you go back and forth? Well, whatever you feel. It's really about being able to see it. You see how like it's just, the light is cooperating. It's just more visible, but not only is it more visible, it just makes it so much easier to fold, right? And it just fits in that channel and just go right back and forth. And I like the fact that I can go several times and I don't have to worry about cutting through the paper. It is a great tool. I use it for hot glue. I use it for everything, right? Because this is something that I can uh, press down hot glue and because it's metal it just pops right off instead of using your finger uh, or anything plastic I use this I have this tool for Gosh, I use it for so many things. It's a crazy tool It's a tool that I think back in the day advance is like do you really think that people need a rub-on tool? I mean after all we do give them a free popsicle stick with every set of rub-ons. I'm like yes But that is nothing plus I have a thing with popsicle sticks. So let's not even go there. I Don't do anything with those but See, just using that. And this, I, I don't know. I like this kind of work. I think as, as a maker, sometimes you just kind of get in the groove of just doing, doing your thing, okay? So I'll just do this on this divide. And then while the chimney piece is here, we'll show that. Going on the tabs. This light actually really helps today. And if you go off a little bit, don't worry about it. It doesn't really matter. So this one on this chimney, all we want to do, it actually has crease lines, but they really don't show very well. So I'm just going to, I'm lining this up, this piece of paper, just so you can see what I'm doing. I'm lining it up to the straight edge of this chimney piece right here. Okay. And I will say this is a little fussy and sometimes people don't want to be bothered with it, but I like the detail. So once it's flush to the smooth side, all I want to do is just mark the same line that I have as my crease line. Do you see that? So I'm just taking that as my mark and I'm just putting that, you just put it, right? So it's just going to be three. It's three little notches. You'll see what we do with that in a second. Okay. So far so good. So we've gone in and, and have done that. Again, all repetition work. Do you have to do all these things? No. Okay. Next, we're going to fold. I believe in having some type of rigid acrylic, rigid. Okay, not rounded. It could be your design ruler, right? That could, that's a rigid edge. See, it's got that one straight edge, right? I wouldn't use the rounded side. 
I would put it against the rigid side. Or these are grid blocks, right? I like grid blocks because, well, they come in a bazillion sizes in one set. And sometimes if I'm doing like something small like that, I'm gonna want a smaller block to hold because I use it to fold against. So I just like the fact that I can have a different block. These are meant for stamping, but they're excellent for folding. Anytime you have to do folding paper, right? So what you're gonna do is you're just gonna take the edge of a, see that straight edge, nice? Line it up with the straight edge of your crease or your fold, right? And just eyeball it, it, it will find its way. It will find its way. And you're gonna push against it, but you're still gonna like, just rest your finger, but just push against it and see how it just, that was it. I didn't need to have serious pressure or anything. You just push against it and it finds its way. Then you can fold it. If you want, you can take uh, a bone folder or a creaser and you can slide over that. That's, that's if you want to have nice crisp folds. So to see this kind of an action, I'll try to keep my hands in shot. I just go in, push with my finger, turn, push every single line. It goes really quick. And again, repetition. Once you do it, see, you can just put that straight edge right against there push against it, turn, and I just rest my finger on the paper. See, that's, then I know it's lined up. So I don't even have to look. You're just, I'm just using my finger as a guide and I push against it. See how easy that is? So the first one, usually you just have that one, you gotta line up. I always hold the window opening, right? Cause we don't wanna tear the window. And again, I'm just pushing, turn, line that up, push, push, right? So it just depends on uh, really the size of the block. But this goes so fast. And this is all stuff, again, that I prep. So I'll do my cutting, I'll do the folding, I'll do all of that. So am I correct that you fold against the groove and not into the groove? Well, that's what I do for this. I know that like when people use, uh, you know, a scoring tool, they're like, you're actually supposed to fold into it. I don't, I fold it against it, that's just me. But yeah, not everybody agrees with that thought process. So here, the little door, I don't think I even did that because see, it's not super, it's not super intense, now it will be, okay? So let's just take the door. So the door, I'm just gonna place the grid block right up against that line and open the door. There you go, just a little bit. And you just go through and do all these pieces. So I, I prefer to fold against it, it's just fine, but some people don't like the break. It, again, that, that's never bothered me as a maker all this time. All right, so let's talk about that little chimney piece. Right, we'll do that as well. Might as well build a little, put a little chimney on this house. Okay, I'm gonna take that. Same thing, this one's tiny, so it might have to get a little close to my face, but you'll get the idea. I'm gonna fold that, fold that. Line that up, fold that. I think, I don't know if I have a craft knife out. Mario, would you grab a craft knife? I don't think I have it in my little caddy, because I don't really use a craft knife much. In case of emergencies, in this case, for this chimney, it's an emergency. And I think there might be, are there one or two in there? There might be two, let's see which one you grabbed. Ooh, you grabbed that one. Can you grab the other one, please? <laughs> Sorry. I just like that, I just like that blade better. Thanks. It's just the other tonic tool that's there, is there not? Thanks. You're welcome. <laughs> Digging on. All right, so, um, for blades, this was a this is my original craft knife from Tonic. It has a really small, see that little thin little blade uh, with a channel in there. You actually pull out the the entire thing. Uh, I think it was this year we launched a new craft knife that actually has this metal thing where you can change the blades. So you can either have like skinny pointy blades or this is my favorite blade. It's called a wide blade. You see it, right? I like it, it's like a pork chop finger, but a knife. I prefer this kind of knife just because it gives me a, a nice angle, it gives me detail, but it also gives me uh, more cutting ability, especially if I'm going through chipboard or anything like that. It's still retractable, right? So you can just, just lock that up when you're gonna use it and you push it all the way up when you're gonna change it, okay? But you only need it that way when you're gonna go to use it. Now, uh, as far as cutting, the big debate, do I cut on this glass media mat? I don't. Um, can you? Yes. Is it going to scratch it? Yes. Uh, does that matter to me? No, because I'm working with it. But what I also found out is that by cutting onto glass all the time, you go through blades quicker. It just dulls your blades. So if I was going to make a cut, I work on a cutting mat. I just put it on here, but I'm not going to actually make a cut. All I'm going to do, I'll hold this up. Let's see if you can see. I can see them, but you see those little indentations that I put with the remnant rub tool. I'm just going to go in with this knife and I'm just going to make a little chop into the paper surface, I'm not going to cut all the way through. 
I love it too, Vicky. It's really good. Like that little blade. I don't know what it is about that blade, but so I'm just going to just make a chop because what I'm trying to do is really just break through the, the surface of the paper. So I'm just putting the blade and just pushing it. You can kind of see that I'm just giving it a little wiggle. So I'm not, I'm not actually touching the glass with the blade. So that's why I don't have a, a cutting mat down, just rocking it back and forth. And you'll kind of feel it going through the paper, right? So I'll show you what I've done. Can you guys see that? See that, just that little. So all that's gonna do is this is just gonna allow that when I fold this, you see how it breaks the corners? Because I found that when you try to crease it, the paper doesn't wanna give as much. And when you're trying to go around this box, it doesn't really wanna fit. So this allows me to just take that piece. And now when that piece is glued on here, right? When you fold this, see how that's gonna match up the fold now? You guys see that? Just because we crease through the paper, it's just going to allow, because this is going on the outside, so we just needed more of that break. So that's just a little tip. If you wanna use the trim, uh, my, my advice is just to mark it and then just go in and just do a little chop with some type of knife. It just makes it easy, right? So that's really cool. Yeah, this is, a, I think this is just called the wide blade from Tonic. The, the knife itself comes with the standard blades. I think they're more of like this, they're like the pointy blade that you would normally find on a regular craft knife because some people like that. It's longer than this. It's like an elongated uh, blade. I thought I had both tools in there. I thought I had another one in there with the other blade, but this is, it's just a wide blade. Yeah, you do. Oh, do I? Oh. Let's see, is that the scratch tool? <laughs> I have a lot of tools in that drawer. All right. Anyway. Okay. No worries. So now we'll talk about building adhesive. Oh my gosh. And it's funny because going through this, I kind of feel like everything I'm sharing is open to debate. And that's just, it's sad that the, the creative industry is sometimes about that, right? Where, uh, and I see this happen to so many makers, you share what you do. And instead of people saying, oh, that's really great. I love that. They're like, oh, I do it this way. It's like, well, that's awesome. Yeah, your opinion is noted. However, I was really just sharing what I did, right? And, and you can share what you did. But I think what, what's important is you have to do what you're comfortable with. People love different glues. They love different tapes. Uh, some people love to work with a glue gun. Some people aren't very comfortable with a glue gun. So you need to work with what medium that you're comfortable with. For me, when it comes to building the houses, I work with all three. I'll work with hot glue for some things. I'll work with collage medium for some things because I want this to to dry and dry clear and give me a little movement. And other things, I'm just going to go in with tape, right? I love score tape, right? Comes in different widths. I'll use the real, real skinny one. Maybe this is like an eighth of an inch. I'll use this on the Paper Village because it's, it has smaller tabs. I'll use a little bit wider. I think this is maybe a quarter inch or just shy on this one. But again, you can do either one. If, if you wanna work with skinnier tape, it's completely fine, whatever you're comfortable with. When I go and work with the tape, I like to work on the nonstick mat, okay? So I'll just start with the tape and go in, place this against the edge and rip that off. Now on this particular one, do you get an overhang? Yes, so if that drives you crazy, go to the skinny one. It really doesn't matter. It's gonna be whatever is, is great for you. But what I like about this particular thing, and I'll just stick to the skinny, although it doesn't cover the whole tab, it's still gonna work. You press it down on the tab, you stick your fingernail there and you rip against your fingernail, okay? And I'm just gonna go in and put this on all the tabs. I don't care that it hangs off. You're not gonna see any of this. This has a release paper that makes it pretty easy. Um, I would just suggest that if you're going to build the bigger house, well, if I'm suggesting it, I'm doing it. I just like the wider tape for the bigger house. It's just gonna make it more durable, right? Even though it's gonna have the overhang just go for it anyway, okay? The little tabs, I'll probably go to skinnier tape. All right. So I'll just talk about that. And I'll, I'll tell you kind of some pros and cons about doing it this way, especially on this house. That's why I wanted to, to share this part with you. When you go in and, and work with this, right? This double stick tape is pretty simple, okay? Pretty simple in the fact that when you, when you work with it, it's just a peel and stick maneuver, all right? When you go to peel off this backing, you're gonna want some, some type of pick. It could be a die pick, it could be whatever. But when you build the house, I like to just start with the foundation walls, meaning I'll take this off first. I'm gonna line these pieces up along the bottom and I always like to work on my nonstick mat because 
then if something is stuck like the tape or whatever I can I can lift it off the surface but I'll line up these pieces right just on the other side of that fold I don't like to overlap it I don't mind giving just a, a little bit of a give you're going to line up the bottoms and you can just set it down just to make sure it's lined up and then you're going to push that down right so then we have just this bend then we'll go in with the other side peel this off you're essentially just making a box right so for this i'll just line this up now depending on what you're going to do uh, with this tape see how i just like to fold that extra i just fold it onto itself right and i'll show you why in just a second so what I like to do is I don't mind rounding the house at first. Some people, it drives them crazy to do that, but paper is, is forgiving, okay? So I'll just go in and I'm going to line up this wall. I just wanna be able to see it. I wanna see that the bottom is going to be somewhat flush, and if it's not, just lift it off. So I don't wanna commit at this point. This is the part that is gonna need adjustment, and if it's closer to your face, I always say close to your face and stick your tongue out, you're good. So once I have that positioned, okay, the house itself is a box, meaning you can press it down on either side to make sure everything is stuck. Do you see that? It's just a square box. If my tape was sticking out, right? If I didn't fold that in and you do this, well, guess what? Now you're gonna have to like go in and lift this off. But this just makes sure that your house is squared before you start putting the rooftop and everything on there, okay? That just makes it easy to have that squared uh, part because sometimes if things are misaligned and you start then you start putting on the roof and it's a little uh, Crooked it just becomes very challenging. You want to have a, a squared foundation Right ish. Okay, so then it comes to this now I'll just talk about the tape and then uh, I'll show you what I do because I'm gonna rip off the tape Right, so let's just say you did the tape like I did for your roof. Can you sure you could go in and you could peel off the tape but here is how the roof is going to go in. This little notch is what goes inside here and covers up these four tabs, not these guys, right? So these are gonna be for this part. So if you're using tape, leave it on. If you're using glue, don't put glue on this at this point because this slides under that, but over all four of those tabs and you flush it right up against there. See, it fits in like a puzzle. And you're gonna stick this down. Could you do this with tape? You can, but here's the challenge. Because it's more of like a, a fit-in movement, I find that the tape always wants to you know, grab onto the, the roof when I'm trying to position it. And I'm like, oh, I'm peeling this off and peeling this off and peeling. It's just really annoying. And there is a little bit of a wiggle room, see on the, the rooftop. So if you want your overhang to be somewhat uh, even, I just like to be able to position it a little bit more. So for this, tape is not my friend. I only do tape pretty much on the sides. Paper Village, this is different. This is 100% tape, but this one, I just like to use glue, right? Let me just peel these off just to, to show you. No problem here, okay? And just show you what I'm talking about. So could you go in with collage medium? Yes. Could you go in with hot glue? Sure. I'll do hot glue, see how that's gonna work. I don't really like to use hot glue when I do a video because it's a bit challenging, but I'm gonna go for it. So the idea here is I'm gonna fold these forward these right here, because I don't need them. So it, once you build a house, you kind of get the idea that you can push this out of the way. Does that make sense? Don't, don't keep it in your way. You don't need it right now. So fold these tabs out. Whether you have tape or glue is irrelevant. Just get them out of your way so we can get that, that rooftop in position where it needs to be. Then we'll take whatever adhesive. I'm just using a glue gun. I like one with a little detailed point. And I'll just put a little blobbity bit, right? Give myself the reason i'm going to do a blob is it's, again it's going to give me some movement inside i'll position the roof right under there right over there position this kind of set it down and then i'm going to flip it over you see that i'm going to look inside then i can take that and just go in with my fingers and push these pieces down from the inside. So you see those tabs? I'm just pressing them down. If you don't wanna use uh, your fingers or hot glue, this is another great use for the tool. You can just go in and press those tabs down. It just gave me some flexibility and it also just allowed me to kind of move this a little bit, right? So let's just say for whatever reason, you don't, you don't like it. Another thing about hot glue is it's very forgiving on craft paper. I don't know if you guys can see that. See how it just, there you go, get that? It just lifts off. 
focus. There we go. It lifts off pretty well. Uh, that's the other nice thing about hot glue versus collage medium. Collage medium is going to want to stay in there and just grab on to whatever you have. So I just put in another little blob of glue and position that. Okay. So I just move these off because I'm going to do the same thing. Just rip these off. All right. But again, if you are 100% tape because hot glue freaks your freak, don't use hot glue because I'm using it. I just, I find that it's much easier for me to build this way. So now I'm going to just fold this down. This is where that house part's coming down. So this will allow me to go in with some hot glue. Again, do a blob, but collage medium. A lot of people use some quick dry glue. There's a lot of glues out there. You have to just use your favorite. So when you go to close this, this is where you kind of want to make sure everything is a bit uh, squared or lined up for your overhang. You're not really going to see it. It's not that big of a deal. Um, but then we're going to flip this over. This is where I'm going to, I'm resting the house. You can't see it, but I'll show you in a second. Um, and I'm just using that rub tool just to press those tabs in from the outside. Now, some people hate the whole idea of light leakers, right? Some people want their house to glow and they don't want any light showing through. There's a lot of different things you can do. You can create little paper tabs. You can fold those in. You can work from the inside and you can squirt hot glue in this channel. Hot glue is going to diffuse the light significantly because hot glue doesn't dry crystal clear. Uh, so you could go in with a glue gun and you could fill that in. I'm never bothered just because I think, you know, the more light, the better. It's going to work for me. All right. So we'll talk about this one. Because it's a roof piece, could you use tape? <laughs> Yeah, you could, but I'm not. I shouldn't have put all the tape on there. I was just showing you how quick it was, and now I just ripped it all off. But could you have done it? Yes. So this guy, here's the thing to know. This one's a little confusing. So the, the entry part has these little tabs, and this guy, believe it or not, actually goes from the point side in. See? That's what works on the rooftop. It's the same angle. I've seen a lot of people kind of position it this way. And you can, it just takes on a different shape, right? But I've, I've seen people do that, but it's really designed that it goes, it goes this way, okay? So now the other debate when it comes to build a house, to roof or not to roof? That is the question. To roof or not to roof? If you're going to go in and add your shingles, right? That's gonna be these pieces right here. Okay? If you wanna go in and add those, Sometimes people just like to go in and do all their roof pieces. That's fine. I find that it's just easier when I'm working that I could just build my house and then I'll go in and add my roof pieces later. But again, you have to do what's going to work best for you. I'm going to take these tabs. I'm going to fold those in and I'm going to get my piece ready and I'm just going to do a pinch. I'll show you what I mean. I'm going to add my glue here and my glue here. Take this piece, place it down and I'm going to pinch it. And the, the reason I want to just squeeze that is because I want it to grab onto those tabs. It's not going to have a connection point at this, at this point. That's okay, right? That's completely okay. But I want that to go on there. This piece, if you want to then secure it, you could go in with a little touch of glue, right? A little dot right there. Can you guys see that? And then it can set into the glue. Don't worry about glue strings. There's a lot of different tricks to get glue strings. One, pull them off. Two, just use your heat tool and they will completely disappear. Okay. You can roll that off. There we go. Done. So now that is secure. That's on there. You got a house. Good to go. That's really like basic building. That's, there's so many different adaptations to what you do once you build the house, once you kind of do the basics. But I will say that the more you do it, the easier it gets. It, it just does. So on something like this, would I go in and, and tape my little details? I don't. I really only use the tape for foundational pieces, uh, unless it's the, the paper village. This is like, I'm all, in with, I'm all in with glue. Again, hot glue, or maybe you want to work with collage medium. Okay, you can, you can do whatever it is that you want to create. So I can just take this and I can glue this down. The thing about collage medium or any type of liquid glue, it just takes longer to hold, right? You just have to sit there. But if you're more comfortable with that, then that's what's really important to remember, okay? Uh, I did the shingles first and the dormer fit fine. Yeah, you can definitely do that. If, if you're putting that on, it just depends on how, how far off of the roof you want it to be, 
right? So if you go in and, and add an element to the house, right? If you want it to sit flush, right? Then you want to put it there and then do your shingles around it. If you want it to sit on the shingles, it, it's still going to work. It will work no matter how you want to do it, right? It's just kind of fun. I like the whole idea. I'll just kind of show you here, right? So for me, I love, let me get the tiny lights out of here. Um, I love the idea where I can get those shingles to go over the siding. Can you see that? So I did the shingles afterwards, but that's just because that's the look I wanted. I wanted, I wanted to be able to pull these pieces up against this versus it smashing these. Cause you never know how these are going to land. So was it just more cutting? Sure. But I'm a maker. I, I love that. So I started at the bottom where I had that straight piece and then I just started building up. But this allowed me to, to have, I think, a little bit more texture against the siding, but you have to do what's going to work the best for you. All right, some people like to, to pre-shingle and some people like to do that uh, later. All right, so collage medium, will it hold this? It will. Uh, glossy accents, it will, but glossy accents is gonna be glossy. It's just gonna take longer to set up. That, that is all. Uh, this band, you know, if you were gonna paint this a different piece, you could do that. You could still add the band later right? Still going to go around the outside. Everything that's here, especially when you get into fussy details, it's just, it's just time. It just depends. You don't have to use every piece that, that comes into the die package uh, when it comes to, to working with it, right? Okay. So how do you attach this? These little tabs, these really fold in. I put a blob of hot glue, hope for the best, and just shove it down and hold it there until it's dry because you can position this wherever you want it to be. Right, you can create uh, anything you want with these pieces. The whole idea is there's not one way to work with these. There's so many different different elements, right? You can add an addition to the side. The addition is literally just four sides with a rooftop. You can add an entryway. The entryway fits over this, right? But the entryway would also work. Let me just grab that. Do, 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 do. If you wanted to add an entryway. Over this, you could, right? You could stick that down because there's another roof piece there. There's a lot of options. So, so many different ways that we can do it. I'm just here, to, I'm trying to follow the chat too to kind of uh, answer as many questions as I, I possibly can. All right, so someone asked about the, let's see, someone asked about the chimney for the paper village and I'll just talk about that. And then I'm gonna get into a lot of other details. So I'll, I'll do my best, honestly guys, to, to follow the, the chat because the whole point of this particular demo was to get you over the fear factor of the village. Build one. I always talk about the, the pancake. I don't cook, but I mean, but I right. But I, but I understand the whole pancake thing, right? When you're making pancakes in the morning, you're getting the pan ready and you're getting the batter and you're testing it all out. The first one may not always look good, but it's still going to taste good. Same thing with building a house for the first time. It may be a little crooked. It may be a little wonky. You may look and say, oh gosh, I want to, hey, maybe even your 20th house may be like that, but you made it. And the more you make it, the more you're going to find little tricks to be like, ooh, okay, this is going to work. Oh, you know what? I actually like putting on the rooftop first because I don't have to worry about that. Or, oh, hey, you know what? I actually like everything being flush and then I can cut pieces to fit in the way I want it. You just have to do as a maker what's going to work for you. So on to uh, the, the Paper Village. So Paper Village 1 and 2, the, the difference really are, are just the, the different sizes for the houses. They all work together. I mean, the whole village thing uh, works really well together. But when it came to this second one, I wanted to add the opportunity of adding a little chimney, right? But it was too challenging to do it the way we did it this way, right? With these tabs and glue this on. Because if you tried to do it here, it just looked really funky because all the all the pitches for the roofs were different angles. So it became very challenging to figure out how do I do a chimney? And it just looked really chunky uh, for this scale. So here was the solution. The solution was including uh, these dies, these little square dies. Can you guys see those little dies? Okay. There's two different size squares. Let me just take these out. And here is our chimney. Okay. So this is in Paper Village 2. So this is going to be just our chimney, which is essentially just a little stack, okay? Then on top of the stack, there's a little square that if you wanted to, you could cover the chimney. Do you have to? No, you could leave this off. You could have 
cotton coming out of it, any kind of smoke, anything that you want. But this square was just so you had a bigger square as a little top piece. It's neat. Could you use this as a window? Heck yeah. You know, you could, you could still use it however you want. But the smaller square was just an, an idea that I had of how you can position the chimney on any rooftop, on any set, regardless of pitch. And that was that when you're cutting out the roof piece, right? So let's just say we're cutting out that roof and we have it on our sticky grid, okay? We cut this out. Then you're gonna take that, that smaller square and you would position this on wherever you want that chimney to be when you're cutting this out, right? So if you want your chimney on the side, or in this case, you want it on the back. And what you're going to do, I'll rip this one off so you can see. You're cutting a hole in the roof. And that hole is just about the size of that finished box-ish, just about. And what that allows you to do, I'll just rip this one off. So actually, I have a craft knife. So let's just slice through that glue a little bit. Just to help me take it off. No. Yeah, I'm really, I'm very aware when it comes to knives. Am I right, Mario? I'm right. Okay, there we go. There's our little chimney. So your chimney is essentially like a little box, okay? So this square now allows you to position the chimney however you want. You, you could have it like a little projectile out here if that's what you want. But the cool thing is, is that you can also position it in the roof to match the angle, right? So in, in this case, just so you can see how it's going in, it goes in upright, that edge goes flush to the house, that has a little glue there. So you can have your chimney sticking up. Does that make sense? I hope it does. The box is pretty, I mean, just making the box really simple. How that goes in, you're just gonna put glue like on the outer edge. I like to work with collage medium. Um, but yeah, you can position that chimney however you want that to be in whichever one of these rooftops you want that to be. So that's how the chimney works. The little square is for the opening and or the skylight for your chimney to go in. The big square is essentially the top for the chimney. And then you as the maker just decide how you want to position that. Okay, that's it. Just wanted to think of different ways that uh, you as the maker could adapt wherever you want that. Because maybe you don't want the chimney there. Maybe you want it right in the center. Well, that's great. You would just need to cut this first and then remove this die and then just cut out that smaller square in a second pass. You do you. I just, it's important to me that if you're going to create a set like this to give you as many ideas. And I understand that there is always, you know, it's like a catch 22. You, you have some ideas, but then it's like so many ideas that sometimes they don't translate well because uh, as a maker, when you purchase, you're like, what do I do with all this nonsense? Well, hopefully these videos that are out there help uh, you understand what you can do with all of those little pieces. Yeah, okay. Everyone's super happy. Totally cool. Done. Awesome. Thank you guys. Okay. So let's see, what else can we do? Well, gosh, there's a bazillion ideas running through my head, but let's just take a little bit at a time. First off, we'll talk about uh, surfaces. Okay. So I mentioned that I like to build the house first. Then what do I do? Well, again, when I'm making a house, I'm already in in the zone of what I want to create. So I already know what I'm going to, to build. So let's say I was going to do a, a brick sided house. Okay. What I would do is I would cut my house, right? My panels out of craft because that's just how I just use craft as a foundation. That's just me. Then I would cut the house out of a paper that I want to use for siding. Okay, so when we had it all set up on that sticky grid and I was cutting all of my craft walls, right, doing all this, this to me is, is the foundation, the structure. So all my structure pieces are in brown. Then if I know, okay, I'm gonna, I wanna do some in brick or I wanna do some in, uh, maybe in cobblestone, right? Or maybe I wanna do some in lumber. You would go in and cut that same house out of another type of paper that you're gonna do all your inking on. For me, it's watercolor paper. I just like watercolor paper because it just takes on just different mediums. So I would go in and cut them out of watercolor. Could you do them out of something else? Yes, it's your siding. So it could be out of uh, foil tape, metallic cardstock, uh, Nina cards, like whatever it is that you wanna work with. But this is what I do for my inking. So I would cut that house again out of white cardstock, okay? Then once it's all cut out, 
and I have all of these pieces and these would, these would be done out of white. So my windows would already be in place. It's very important that the siding matches your house because if you didn't have the same openings, when you go to add the siding to the front, you're gonna cover all your windows, right? So you need that same foundation, but you would have all of these done out of white. And I probably should have had some, but I don't. You guys will get it, you're visually. But just imagine this being out of white cardstock. So it matches the same pieces. All I'm going to do is go in and treat these as siding. So I'm gonna take my scissor, I'm gonna go right into that score line. I don't have to go in with the, the remnant rub tool for this one, and I'm going to cut on all of those score lines, just cutting these off, okay? Um, I like to just work with a, a larger scissor because I know I, I can get the entire cut in one pass, right? You can work from the back of this, but you're just going to go in and cut off all of your tab pieces, okay? Get your fingers out of the way. Cut right along there. I'm just gonna trim this off just a bit more. Excellent, excellent. You're, and you would do this for any place that you want your siding. Okay, so it's gonna be your front and back panel. So this is what you have, right? You have siding pieces for your house. If you don't want siding on the door, cut it off. Go in with a craft knife and cut off that, that door because maybe you want to add something else. But it is important that you have your siding pieces cut out of cardstock first. Because if you try to say, well, hello, Captain Obvious, I'm gonna do these out of brick, so I'm just gonna do my brick and then I'm gonna run it through the die cut, that die cut, when you run it through your machine again, is gonna smash your texture. So you might have a pattern, but your bricks are not bricks. Your, your cobblestones are not cobblestones. You flatten them out. So that's why we wanna have our pieces first. Then we would take our pieces and emboss them. So to emboss them, you have some options, okay? You can work with whatever size embossing folder, or in this case, when we did the collection, we did smaller scale of some of the patterns, right? So you can see that the bricks are smaller, the cobblestones are smaller, and the lumber, instead of it running uh, big vertical wood grain, they're, they're all these little horizontal planks, okay? But the beauty of this is that you can take those smaller folders, let me just find out where I did that, there we go. And you'll notice that when you take this, all of your panels, regardless of what they are, are going to fit in here. So that's why this size really worked well. So I would have my cut panel. I know that I wanna put brick on this particular piece of siding. So now I'm gonna take, remember this would be watercolor paper, whatever that is. You can do this pre-inked or you can ink after, right? Some people have a, a whole technique where, uh, in fact, Zoe Hillman has a great technique on brickwork on her blog. I know Stacy has a great technique on wood grain. Uh, on her blog, there's a lot of different ways that you can do the treatment. Some people like to do treatment on pre-embossed cardstock. Others would already have a piece of inked paper and then do it. Doesn't matter either way, okay? Because the ink is not going to uh, destroy the texture. But then you're gonna put this in, you're gonna run it through your machine, and now you would have a textured side to the house. So you could do all of your treatment, you could do your inking, you could do whatever it is, and then when you're ready to add the siding, you're just gonna use your favorite glue for that collage medium because I get the little slip inside and then you just install the siding, right? So it makes it really easy because again, you're building houses, right? You got all your houses built, then you're working on siding and you're doing inking. And so I have like a whole bucket of, of side panels that are embossed. There's, there's so many different ways that we can work with it. Some people don't even like to do the siding thing. Maybe you don't want to use an embossing folder and go in and do inking because maybe that's just too much, right? Maybe you're like, look, Holtz, I got stuff to do this holiday season and building houses is not one of them. Okay, well, there's ways that we can create some shortcuts. So that's the whole idea of this particular demo. Not only touch base on the how-tos, right? And there's definitely more in-depth videos on creating uh, panels and, and all of that. But other how-tos are finding different surfaces around your creative space. Corrugate, right? Now this was a product I did with Ideology years ago, but you can still buy this. You can find it at, a lot of times you can find it at a packing store, you can find it on Amazon, you can rip off the front of a cardboard box. You might have one of those little twist and turn paper crimpers, okay? But corrugate is a great surface that you would take this corrugate and this is what you would cut your panels out of, right? So instead of doing the white cardstock and all that, if you don't plan on inking, find a substrate that you like for siding and cut this. So you can use corrugate and you can cut through. Is it gonna squash this a little bit? 
Yes, but I mean corrugate because it's packing material. It's very rigid. See, even squeezing it, you can't really smash it out. It'll flatten some, but not tons. But you can go in and cut corrugate. And the beauty of that is that you can have, well, little log sided houses. I shared this last year. You could check out the video. I think it's uh, when, when I did the holiday demo series. I think this was actually in part one um, of how to create this. No different, right? I still made the structure. You can see that my foundation was still craft. And then I did my panels. You can see the split right there where I cut the same panels out of corrugate. Then just by doing a little inking with your distress, you can still see it's got some texture, but see they're a little smashed, but not much, right? They got a little droop to them, but I think they still work. Makes for a great log side at home. Super simple, right? What can I do to avoid destroying the frames of the windows when I emboss the paper? Well, so here's the thing about the frames of the paper. The frames are really not meant for the texture, if you will. So let's just say that's a great question. Someone said, how do you avoid that? So when you're cutting this out, you're going to have this little cross. that's going to have the brick. But really, remember on this series, in addition to the windows, you have window frames. So what I would do is once I cut this out of uh, the windows and I have those little crosses, I would cut these crosses out of the texture, my siding, right? Because my cross is still in the base and then I've got a window frame. So when I place the window frame over the top, it covers it. So you don't necessarily want texture going into those little cross beams. So, so you can chop those out. That makes it really easy. Um, let's see, give the paper a spritz with water before embossing. Yes. Yeah, well, we'll talk about embossing, but yes, I'm gonna, I'll talk about like how you achieve the, the effect just to, to kind of keep that. But on these little cross pieces, really, they're, they're very insignificant from a texture because even if you do the, the spritzing and embossing, when you go to glue on your window frame, that little bumpy texture might impact how well this attaches itself to uh, the wall. So sometimes you don't even realize that you don't need the, the in-between layer because you have this as a foundation. Yes, you might have something textured, but the window frame that you're going to cut is going to cover all that up, okay? So hopefully that helps. So corrugate is going to be one option and I'll take you through and give you some embossing tips uh, as well, just to, to share. Another cool way, and this was something that Stacy did years ago and actually kept it from one of the makes. It was attached to the stick, but I'll be honest, the stick had some, some stuff that happened to it. So it's, it is now stick free, but the idea, brilliant, which is making a house out of something patterned or printed, okay? But when you do that, you have to be aware of the substrate, okay? So you have a couple of options. One, you can build the house, you can cut pattern paper and use it as siding. Yeah, you could definitely do that. But because I'm not really focusing on a, a texture for this particular idea, I find the fact of building a house out of paper and then just gluing paper onto it later just really uneventful for me. The only reason I'm gonna, I'm gonna go on and add siding is because I want something dimensional or textured or all that. If it's printed, you just wanna make sure that your printed paper is thick enough, okay? So here's some, some options to think about because you probably have a lot of stuff in your creative space that maybe you're not thinking could make a house, okay? So what that means is, I'm just going into my little ideology stash. Got a couple stuff here. So look at some of your papers that you might have. Maybe it's ideology, maybe it's another brand, whatever. These are the new mini file folders, okay? So let's take a look at the actual paper composition, right? So this is a thick paper, perfect to die cut the house and build the house out of this because this has a, it's actually thicker than craft. So there would be no reason to cut this and cut this. You can just cut and build your house out of this if you have a thick printed substrate. So that would be file folders, any of the ideology layers. This is the same material layers. It's that, it's that thick substrate. This is what Stacy used to build the house, okay? So there are some big layers in here that you can use to die cut and actually build the house out of a paper. But let's say you don't have this. People are like, okay, well, what can I do? Um, some people say, well, could I laminate paper? Well, the challenge of laminating paper is it doesn't really cut well, and it also doesn't want to fold well because a laminate is going to be plastic. So when you try to fold those little tabs of your house, they're not going to want to fold. So you'll have to go in and cut. 
but a coated paper is going to work really well. So let's say you don't have that, okay? Uh, will a thin that cut through that thick of paper? Absolutely, it will cut no problem. That's what this is. This is this, which is the same as this. This is all cut with thinlets. So this paper is die cuttable, which is great, okay? The other thing to think about, but it's, it's good to keep in mind. I mean, asking that question, is it gonna be too thick? That brings me to my next point, which is, what if you get a little creative and you're like, okay, I get it. So I'm gonna start looking around and, and look at some papers. What if you don't have anything that is this thick? Okay, maybe you have, let me find these guys. One of my favorites, the ideology backdrops, okay? Actually, before I get into that, let's let's tidy up just a little bit. Just want to clear the deck. I'm going to get back to embossing. Don't let me forget that. Uh, I'll keep these off to the side. I'll get some of these house out of the way. Again, corrugate. Perfect. We'll talk about layers. There we go. Just to clear the deck, just so you guys can kind of see what it is we're, we're working on. Okay. There we go. Look at that. Isn't that better? Ah, peace. Okay. So... If you have layers or file folders, okay, that's going to be this guy. Look how cool that is, right? I love just that printing. You could also use, say, ideology collage paper. Collage paper would be pretty fun. Collage paper, um, that's this stuff. Collage paper is your jam because this stuff is super thin, right? Maybe you have tissue paper, anything like that. So collage paper is cool because you can collage this. I would just collage it onto the white paper that I would normally make a house with, right? Which is kind of brings me to the next idea that you can take this and collage it onto white and then you have some printed paper. That's another idea. That's a, I saw someone post that as a comment. Yes, there's many things you're gonna have and hopefully that's what this, this whole demo session is doing is sparking ideas of using what you have in ways that you may not kind of connect the dots. Cause sometimes we just get stuck in brown paper mode, right? Like, ooh, it's just this, okay? Let's say you have this. Let's say you have a, a pattern paper. It doesn't have to be ideology backdrops. I just happen to love that. Let's say you have your favorite scrapbook paper, pattern paper, gift wrap, right? That's cool. That is thin. It's all about thickness. You have to feel it. And I can just, I can just tell you that once you make a house, you'll be able to pick something and go, okay, that's going to be too thin for the house, right? It has that little flip. But this, okay, this is going to make a good house because this has a, a flick versus a fliggle. There's a flick and a fliggle, right? This one just flicks. This, a fliggly sound, right? Fliggle? So, fliggle? Oh, is that a, oh, I meant wiggle. But, oh, okay, well, flick and fliggle. There you go, you'll remember it that way. But I meant like wiggly. You know what I meant, okay. Um, so, so another thing is like, maybe you have old Christmas cards, right? Christmas cards, maybe you collect vintage Christmas cards or you go to the thrift store. Christmas cards are great because, well, you can find Christmas cards that are thick. If they're a thick one, it's gonna work. If they're a fliggly one, right? Cause maybe you bought them cheap, they're probably not gonna work. Yeah, there you go, flick and fliggle. So let's say you have this and you really wanna use it or you have worn wallpaper and you really wanna use this. Now, one way is to run this through your Xyron, the adhesive like we shared last week and stick this on to a heavier substrate. But when you do that, don't forget math, math. You have to do addition. Meaning if you're working on a piece of paper, you need to kind of compensate knowing that 130 pound, that worked for a house. So if I stick this onto something that's already this thick, it's just gonna make folding and building that much more challenging. So I would go to like, I don't know, a lesser weight stock. And that's going to be, I'm just trying to pull this out just so I can make sure that I read the, the right things, okay? That's going to be, oh my gosh. Just trying to work all these out. In the distress world, mixed media heavy stock, 110, that is the thinnest of these. So it's thick, but it's thinner. So this is the foundation that I use if I go to cover it with something. So here's the little, Trick. Now you could use other cardstock. You don't have to use mixed media. You can use whatever cardstock you want. But I, I don't want to waste my Xyron on this, right? I Xyron the pre-adhesive stuff last week to show you how you can make like quick peel and stick stuff. But if I'm just going to stick paper down to a substrate, what I go in and do is just use 
good old fashioned glue. Now it could be a glue stick, it could be collage medium, but I wanna just share some tricks uh, when you're creating background paper, whether you're using wrapping paper or anything, okay? When you go to use a thin paper, you would start by cutting your mixed media. So this is that distressed mixed media. This is 110 pound uh, to size. And you're going to have your backdrop of choice. Now, the reason I did this size is because again, that's taking that eight and a half by 11, cutting it in half, five and a half. So now I've got that uh, five and a half by eight and a half sheet of paper. Backdrops, these are six by 10. So it's just a quick little trim of the paper, right? You're gonna take a little bit off the bottom, a little bit off the side, and now you have a piece that's going to be perfect to fit over the top. So I like to cut everything to size first before I get in. Again, I will do, uh, I would go in and just do all that prep first. Then I'm going to take collage medium. Could you use a glue stick? Yes, but you wanna have a glue that's gonna dry really quick because if everything is really wet, you could end up with lasagna paper, but even this trick might help you with lasagna paper. And I would go in, if I'm gonna do a lot of gluing, a lot of messy gluing, I'm either gonna work on my craft mat or again, just get a piece of wax paper. So you're gonna dip this in. Well, let's just do it, shall we? Um, yeah, I think you grabbed me a piece, but I think I set it somewhere. Well, let's take another one. All right, just to, just to give you the idea, okay? Just take that. All right. Now, uh, Distress Collage brushes, they come in three different sizes. I like to work with the biggest brush for this because it's just, it's quick. So I just dip that into the jar and you're just going to take your collage medium and you're going to brush from the center out and you just need a thin layer. You don't need a lot. The reason, uh, could you use Xyron? Again, yes, but Xyron is just gonna be costly if you're making a lot of paper. But if, you, if you've got that in your creative budget, great, go for it. I, I just have glue and glue goes a long way. Real thin amount, you don't need much. Set that down. You're gonna place this. Um, I'll position this right on the edge here. here. Let me just move here. It's very hard to do this on camera. There we go. I've got that. I'll position this right along the edge, right along the edge, because collage medium has a drying time of now. So I wanna position that first, and I'm just gonna smooth that off to the side, just with my hands, right? And I would just repeat, okay? I would just do my glue and repeat. But here's the other trick. Um, if you're doing a lot of gluing, you can always take your brush and you can wrap it in a baby wipe in between your gluing sessions instead of putting it in water because you don't want to add water to your brush. Water is what's going to make your paper turn into lasagna. But when I go in and glue paper, and you know when you're gluing paper, you sometimes get little air pockets, right? Right there, even if you smooth it out. And you also start to get the bend. So even if I go in with a brayer and do all that, I'm going to start getting uh, that curve. And that's okay, um, but then you have to put it under books or whatever. So if you have a mink, a laminator, anything, I love my mink, the high spot mink rocks because it has different temperature settings. I fire this sucker up to number five. And after I put this on and I smooth this out with my hands, I take my carrier sheet, right? So I just get the, you can get replacement carrier sheets. I just cut one that's a little bit bigger than my paper, right? I place that into the carrier sheet and I will run this through the mink on setting number five. And what that does is not only does it apply pressure, right? It's going to kind of steamroll that, but it also applies heat to dry the glue immediately. And then you have perfect paper from your backdrops. So this is backdrop on mixed media. And it's a great way, again, this is one of those things that I do when I don't have um, when I just don't have any creative juju. I, I have those days too, where it's like, I want to do something creative, but I don't feel like building anything or it's just going to require prep work. So I'll just sit there, get my glue out, glue, stick that down. I like to smooth it out with my hands, put it in the mink. By the time this one's done, I've already put glue on the next one, put my paper down. But I like the fact that now I can go in and I've got great pattern paper. Again, this could be anything. It doesn't have to be perfect because I'm gonna die cut it anyway, right? But you can, it's got that feel, it's got the flick, not the fliggle, right? And the beauty of this is that when you cut your houses, man, you could have the cutest little houses ever out of your favorite papers, your favorite stamps, your favorite gift wrap, your favorite whatever. And yes, it die cuts through both layers, 
creates your score lines, all of that. Does it create that little rip? Absolutely. Because remember, we're, we are folding against the grain, but that's okay. And this to me is about as thick as I would want to go. Um, backdrops, this is a, about 100 pound. So we're actually doing 100 onto 118, but one is text weight and one is cover weight. So it, it totally works. That's why I wanted to tell you. So if you have uh, scrapbook paper and you want to glue it onto that, a laminator or a mink is a great way to flatten and just make sure that not only is it smooth, but then when you die cut it, you don't have air pockets because that's what would suck, right? Even if you think you did a good gluing job, if you didn't get glue in the middle, right? In some area and you have an air pocket, when you die cut it, that pocket could actually show up on the edge of something and now you're trying to like go in and patch it up, okay? So that's a cool thing. And yeah, how great is this? I can't wait to build this. This is gonna be so, so cute to have a little plaid house out of your, your backdrops, a little plaid roof. I mean, because the great thing about these houses, let's face it, they can go on a mantle, they can go in a centerpiece, they can go on a tree, they could do uh, so many things. A, a mink is like a mini laminator. That's what it does, it's heat and pressure. The difference between a mink is it has different temperature settings. So depending on what you're doing, um, especially if you're doing foiling, that's, that's the beauty of that. So I love my mink simply because I like that it can get really hot to a five. Uh, so to me, that's hotter than a laminator. Uh, do you have to let it dry before putting it in? You don't have to let it dry before putting that in. But what you wanna make sure is that you're using your hands and you're smoothing it out because if you put it in this pocket when you've got collage medium oozing out everywhere, well, you're just gonna to have to clean your carrier sheet every single time. So still do your gluing like normal, but then once you've done your little smooth, put it in there and you go. So you do not have to wait for it to fully dry but as I mentioned, collage medium has a drying time of now. And you'll also see that it gets out a lot of the moisture, which is good too. So yeah, great way that you can create uh, little houses out of, out of pattern paper, as long as you put it on something thicker, because you're not gonna want to have a house made out of something very flimsy, but go around your creative space. You're gonna find so many things. Now you're gonna be shopping and you know, you're gonna go to like a Christmas card, be like, ooh. It's got a nice flick to it. Okay, this is this can this is gonna be cut up to a good a good house, right? Totally works, right? Right. That's stuff Flickle. everywhere. That's the stellar part. Well, of you know, it was my brain that just wasn't like I I think it just wasn't connecting the dots. Flickle is awesome. Is what was happening. Okay, so let's go into uh, just doing some some embossing tips, and then we'll we'll talk about some other elements. I love just to see what you guys are, are doing when it comes to, um, uh, yeah, Tammy. So here's the thing. Uh, now that I'm sharing this tip, I'll, I'll let you guys in on a little secret that I've, I've used this tip for years, but people ask me all the time when I do a demo um, and I don't really focus on it too much just because, well, I just don't. So this is kind of a little, I don't know, a little exit here. So when I do a lot of these backgrounds, right? And I demo and I'm doing my inks and my sprays and I dry it, you know, during the demo that I don't necessarily fully cook everything. I just kind of go for it and I'm, it is what it is. In order to get my backgrounds to all stay somewhat flat, after my demo, I'll take my tags, my backgrounds, whatever, and I'll run them through the mink that same way. So all of my inked things that have that curve, I'll go in and flatten them out so even if something has a ripple in it, that's what I'll do with uh, the laminator. Yeah, I'll do that. Just as long as you don't have anything, you know, that has like, you could run embossing powder, but it gets really messy. So I just don't do anything that has embossing powder on it, but everything else, texture paste, you know, any of that. Yeah, if it's regular texture paste, I'll run all this through. Uh, if you have something that has embossing, you don't want to do even dry embossing because it's going to flatten it out right? But maybe you want it flat. So maybe, maybe you want the design, but not the texture. So the mink will do that as well. But yeah, for all of my inked tags and backgrounds that are all kind of warped after a demo, that's really what I, that's what I do this way. When I put them in the tin, well, besides that, you can fit a ton in there because they're all flat. Now they're ready to go when I do a card. So that's just something I don't, I don't talk about every week, but yeah, it's a, a great little trick. I and I still love my mink for foiling. All right, but that's, that to me is what creative should be about. Just kind of sharing your tips and tricks. So we'll talk real quick about some 3D and then I'll share some, just things that are a little bit more, <laughs> a little bit more, I don't know, random when it comes to the village. Cause I, it was the one idea that I had last night. Well, I say one, but it was many, but it was just one that I had. 
So we're going to do some 3D embossing, okay? When you're doing 3D embossing, you cannot do 3D whoop, embossing. I just knocked down the cutting pads. You cannot do 3D embossing uh, in your Sizzix. Besides that, the, the folders won't even fit. You just don't want to do that. You can do regular embossing. There are small embossing folders um, that Sizzix does for the sidekick, but 3D is not one of them. 3D requires a, a regular machine. Again, it could be a fold away, a vagabond, a big shot, whatever it is that you want to work with. But we'll talk specifically about this. So I've got, got my handle open. Let's open this guy, click this in. And let's do, well, we could do brick. I have that. We can also do some cobblestone, okay? And we'll just do a little bit of, of embossing. And we're gonna do this little guy. I, like, I love the cobblestone one, but I, I love the brick too. So we're gonna take our paper, and I like to just do small backgrounds when I'm doing this. It, this just makes it really easy for this size panel, especially for the village. This is a very simple cut. It's taking your eight and a half by 11, quarter cutting it, which I've talked about with the regular tonic trimmer. So this is what I normally have in my, my demo stack, which are just card panels, four and a quarter by five and a half. But I'll just take my card panels when I'm getting ready to do a little embossing for the season. Um, I'll take the little mini trimmer, right? And this way I can cut these in half. So this is just going to, to go in at two and three quarters. So I'll just cut my card panels in half and that's what's gonna give me this size for my folders, okay? There you go, lock that closed. So I've got a bunch of different panels. You can do watercolor paper. You really can do a lot of different, uh, a lot of different papers. When you're going to do embossing, here's what we're going to need. We're going to need the platform and you're going to need one cutting pad, okay? For 3D embossing, it's just the platform and one cutting pad. So no second cutting pad and no thin die adapters, right? Do not use for embossing. That's why a big caution. So we don't need those. When you emboss, it really just depends on what you're creating. You as the person uh, need, to, need to create that, okay? We're gonna take a little bit of water. You don't wanna hose this down, but you want some water. And the water's gonna do a couple of things. One, it's gonna soften the fibers of the paper, okay? So it's gonna allow a little bit more flexibility, which provides more detail. But also when it goes in, it's going to uh, actually create a little bit more rigidity because you're softening the fibers and they're firming up. So I'm just gonna use the sprayer. I'm gonna give it a spray on each side, all right? Just a little mist. This happens to be distressed watercolor cardstock. You're gonna place that in. It could be textured side up. It could be smooth. It could be whatever paper it is that you want to, to work with. Let me try to get this in frame if I can, okay? So when I go to use this, I prefer to go in at an angle. I think if you go in at an angle, you're just gonna get even pressure versus this is gonna hit this and then it's gonna drop off the edge. So just give that a little, little angle, okay? And then we're going to place this down, give a little turn, let that engage, put my hand up here. And we're just gonna do one pass on this, okay? Now, normally you've seen the pass like 3D, three passes, all of that, but the fold away, as I mentioned, has way more pressure. So that is one pass with a 3D folder. Unreal, right? If you did probably three passes in the fold away with the 3D folder, it's probably gonna blast right through your yeah, paper. Confetti. Yeah, because this is 118 pound cardstock, and that is the detail that it gave on a single pass. That's the difference. So again, is there one right machine for everything? No, not, not everything, but like I know that I'm gonna be doing cuts. I know that I'm gonna to wanna to work on this platform. I know that I'm gonna to wanna to do 3D, so I have my fold away out now for the season. It doesn't mean I don't love my Vagabond. It doesn't mean I don't have my sidekick ready. It just, it just is, right? That's, that's the whole thing when it comes to, to that because I love the creative convenience of the pressure of that, okay? So that's really the, the trick. Now there's a lot of things that we can do to these and I don't wanna, I don't wanna make this particular demo uh, very ink heavy. I've had, there's many demos that I have on my blog that show different ways to create some cool effects, but just some things to think about. Um, you could ink over this, so you could, you could ink or you could start with an inky background. So maybe we have, uh, let's pull out, let's see, that's a tag. I might have an inky tag. Let's look in here, All right? I don't care if it's a, a tag or what it is. Let's see if I've got some good, just something colorful and blended. Ooh, that's a good cobbly stone. No, this is all a bit, these tags are a bit more decorative. Okay, so let me just go into a background. 
just to show you. Um, ooh, these are nice. That's nice. Ooh, that's real nice. See, I love going back and looking at backgrounds, don't you? Even ones that like, I'm sure at one time I looked and I was like, ooh, I hate this, but now I like it for this. So it's gonna, it's gonna work. All right. And because I normally, as I mentioned, work on four and a quarter by five and a half and I want to emboss this, cool. Just get out my little trimmer. Give this a little slide, a little cut. So I've got that. This one happens to be mixed media, right? Doesn't always have to be watercolor paper. And let's say we want to create some stones out of this, or maybe we want some really kind of funky oxidized brick wall or something. Okay, right, we could do that. Let's give it a whirl, see what happens, okay? Excellent, one cutting pad, platform, paper. Same rules apply. Spray, spray, put this in, okay? But this time, I want to add a little detail. I'm going to see if this is going to work well or not. Take an archival pad. Right? Now you can use a brayer if you want to use a brayer, or you can just take your ink pad. And I'm just, you can hear tap, 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 just to get some ink out there onto that folder. Could you go in and, and rub this around? Yes, you can apply however you want. But I want to have a pretty decent amount of ink. Then I'll go in. Give it the fold. I just always start on one. Isn't that weird? Like I don't like to, I don't crank backwards. So strange. It is weird to keep doing this on in camera view though. All right, we're gonna engage. I gotta push this. It's hard to just. I just I need like an extra hand when I'm doing this. Okay, I'm just gonna run that through. Where I was like, I got it. All right, then I'm gonna run that through my single pass. But this is what we end up with, right? So by adding ink to your folder, archival ink. Okay, because this is an oil-based permanent ink, and it's nice that we have uh, Distress Archivals in regulation. It, only four colors, but hey, I'm going to be happy. It's four colors that I would use for this technique, right? A dark brown like ground espresso, a nice warm brown like vintage photo. This is great for wood grain. I love hickory smoke for cobblestone because it has that nice little gray grunge in there, and then, of course, black soot for brick. But this is oil-based, which means it's going to stay wet enough on the plastic because something like stays on wouldn't stay wet. It would actually stay on the plastic. That's what it's designed to do. But then it would transfer and, and give me a nice uh, crisp image. If you try to do this with ink or oxide, distress ink or oxide, you could, but it doesn't want to transfer as well because it's not a permanent ink. But look at what that did. See how it just put that color into those grooves? I mean, come on, like zippity do from a background. Right, so now everyone's gonna be like, oh my gosh, how did you create that? You're like, hey, this took me hours. I hand painted those bricks, right? Are you kidding? It's like, how am I storing my archival pads like this? On my table, that's it. I don't have any, there's no, I don't, I don't have any holder for this. I just have them sitting in a stack because I use them, I use them all the time. So there's no, there's no storage. I don't know if Ranger even has storage for the, the big ink pads, but archival is gonna work. It's going to work well. And I like my ink pads upright. So could you use pigment ink? You could try. There's going to be other inks out there. There really is. Uh, someone said, would it stain the folder? I knew it. I was waiting for that. I was waiting for the stain. Does it? No. Is it permanent? Yes. So if you want your folder to be clean, right? Meaning maybe you want to use this on, on white paper and you don't want to risk any color. You can clean your folder. And here's how you clean it. You're going to take a cleaner. In this case, I'm going to use archival cleaner, okay? Because that is what cleans archival. I'll take the cleaner. I'll put this onto the same side that I did the ink. And normally, I just like to dab this. Um, it's got a little fabricy thing, but you, if you have one of these, you know all too well that you know sometimes when you do this, you'll end up just trashing it. But I'm just going to get some cleaner on there because it just dabs on, and it's kind of a. Can you see it? It's a little shiny. Not a huge fan of stamp cleaner, but. Just want to make sure that I have it on there. Stamp cleaner is, is a solvent mixed with a conditioner. So it actually has a little weird oily bit. Okay. But then I'm going to take a paper towel, fold it up. And instead of scrubbing this, because that would be like cleaning a cheese grater, I'm just going to let my machine do the work because why not? That's what it's all about. It's out. It's here. 
I'm just going to run that through. And then all of my ink that was on my folder is now transferred onto the paper towel and now my folder is clean. Mm -hmm. So that's how you clean it. So all that little bit, yes, that was on the folder, but it was permanent. Like it wasn't going to transfer with water, but that's a great way to, to clean that off with just your archival cleaner. And if you didn't want to use a paper towel, because maybe you had a background where you're like, Hey, I don't care if it's going to get a little bit, well, then you could do a background, right? But you could just use this paper towel again and again. So that's how you clean it off. But no damage is done to the folder and the folder is clean. It's dry. It gets the stuff in and out of, of everything. That's why I prefer a paper towel because it's absorbent. So if I had extra cleaner in the wells of my design, especially you see like there, just it takes it out. So there you go. That's that's what it's all about. It's about just remembering that, you know, if you've been doing backgrounds and I see many of you have been doing backgrounds, which is so great. Um, use those right some some that you look at and you're like i don't really know what this is it could turn into something amazing but adding the ink is key and another thing especially if you're going to use a machine like this um, if you have a machine that allows multi-pass so maybe you're doing a vagabond you could like emboss it once ink the folder and emboss it again or you could ink the folder if you wanted this darker you could ink the folder and do multi-pass, but not with this, right? If you wanted to get this ink darker, I wouldn't do a multi-pass with the fold away. Again, that's where the Vagabond would come in, right? Or maybe have a big shot, something like that. So hopefully those little tips and tricks on 3D were helpful as far as, you know, either doing paper and doing your inking later or inking pre uh, backgrounds that you have. Yeah, it's just a machine. I'm, I have to say that I don't think there's ever gonna be a machine that I will love more than my Vagabond. That's just it. Um, you know, that was very early on in Sizzix. If I got to design my dream machine, it was that. But it is very cool to know that there are other machines to say, oh, I can do a single pass. That makes it easy, right? But it doesn't mean that you have to have, uh, have everything, right? Okay, let's see. I've buried stuff over here, Mario. I've tried to, it's like, where's that little, okay, here's my last little idea that I wanted to share with you. Okay, sometimes it's about the cute factor, right? Sometimes it's about taking something small because you look at these houses and you're like, hey Tim, this is really great, it's fun, but like I said, I'm limited on time for the holidays. These guys are so quick and easy to put together, the little paper village, okay? So I followed the same, the same idea. I set it up and I just cut a bunch of these little guys out of craft. I do whatever design that I want to do, or you can make multiples of whatever it is that you want to create of. Okay. You can say, oh, I want to create a bunch of these. Or I want to create a bunch of this house, whatever it is. I just pick one and go with it. So then I have them in, in their little bag. So here's my paper village. A paper village is really simple. It's got two identical walls. One, you're going to put a door in and windows. You'll have a roof and you're going to have a little overhang. Now on the paper village, you'll see from the die set itself, it's very, very simple. These aren't labeled just because it's either, you know, it's this house or this house or this tower and the rooftops just, they, they're interchangeable. It just depends on how much overhang that you want. So the paper village series, both one and two are incredibly forgiving. I do the same thing when it comes to uh, utilizing craft. I'll take the craft paper. I'll still go in with the remnant rub tool, go into that little channel, right? and just add that little extra score line. Now, do you have to? Really, some people don't even bother with this step. If, if you run it through, sometimes even a multi-pass. Now, I do these on the sidekick. So the sidekick, although it's got great pressure, it's not super pressurized like the other one. So on a sidekick, you might wanna do a multi-pass, right? If you just wanna crank one way and the other, it will provide a stronger crease if you wanna skip this step altogether by using this tool, because I will admit that, you know, this one could be a little tedious, but I don't, I don't mind the process. I love that. I think I kind of learned that from Diane as well. I used to always complain about all these, that sometimes I put too much into it. And, and I remember Diane saying, but sometimes just repetition is so peaceful to a maker. It's, you're doing something creative, but it lets your mind rest. Like she talks about how she does her doodling and journaling and she's totally right. So even, even going in and cutting or just going in and scoring, I like the, the repetition to give my brain a rest. All right, so I'm gonna go in, fold this. I'm just gonna share some tips when it comes to what I learned. And I learned this, uh, just trying to kind of make this idea happen. There was a lot of trial and error for this, so I just wanna share it with you. Let me just fold these really quick. And we'll get into making 
gingerbread. Because I love the idea of making little gingerbread houses, especially at the holidays. I just think they're cute, especially this size. They make great ornaments. They make great uh, little gift tag additions. Tammy B did a really cute little kind of a, a mug hugger where she did the little house and then cut a notch and you can set it on a, a mug for hot cocoa. I mean, it's a really great idea. So I'm not sure if Tammy has that on her, on her blog yet or not. It's a cute idea to use the, the little paper village to set on the side of a mug, especially if you like to give away, you know, mugs and hot cocoa and stuff. So I've done all the little work. Oh, let me fold this one. I don't think I did the crease. I'm going to go for it. I'm going to risk it. There we go. No problem. Okay. I've got my pieces. Let me stack these up. You guys see that? Okay. So if you want to create gingerbread, you can do several different things to achieve that look. Here's what I have learned. And here's what I want to share with you, because what we're going to do is we're going to transform a house like this into something like this, right? Just a cute little gingerbread house, great little detail, cute little ornaments, right? Just a lot of fun. And I love the charm of this. This might be too uh, clunky for you. I, I like it. I loved making this as a kid. Why? It involved candy, right? Add a piece, eat a piece, add a piece, eat a piece. That's, that's the whole idea about making these, but a lot of fun. And there's things that I want to point out of what you, what you can kind of achieve with this with this look. So first thing, when it came to building this, oh, thanks you guys. You guys are awesome. You're so sweet, all the kind comments. See, sometimes I, I said to Mario that I really thought that, eh, well, I even told you guys at the beginning that it's probably, this demo could just bore a lot of people, but. This is stellar. Hopefully it's not, <laughs> right? <laughs> it's less than stellar, right, it Mario? Stellar. <laughs> um, okay, well, thank you. So. When I was playing around with the, the villages, right? So we've talked about Paper Village and we talked about, I do love Candy Kim, you know that. Um, and we talked about all the, the different houses. I always believe as a maker, and I've said this before and I'll say it again and again and again, creative things are an investment. There's no joke about that, right? You know, even as a designer or a company that, that creates product, like all the different brands, we launch product because that's that's our business. I'm a product designer, That that's the business. We we need product to be out in the marketplace. And truth is we need all different retailers in order to make that happen. I know everyone has uh, their judgments and opinions and your judgments are noted, not appreciated, but noted. Um, but it takes all different retailers. It takes big box retailers, it takes online retailers, it takes independents because not everyone has an independent store they could take a class. They rely on online and they're great online stores. Not everybody has either or, or they have the ability to go into a big box. And without all those, a manufacturer cannot afford <laughs> to manufacture product and bring it in at a reasonable price, whether it's made in the US or imported. It still takes a lot of resource and it needs all of that. So when people judge who or should or shouldn't be selling product, I just find that just like very selfish in, in that mindset. And because of that, because of the ability to design and develop product, it's important to me as a designer to make sure that when you're creating, you know that when you buy something, you're gonna have more than one use. That's the way I think about it, right? That if I'm doing a folder, okay, I wanna make sure like, what else can we do with it? Well, let's incorporate ink with it. That'd be kind of fun because maybe you don't just like emboss paper, right? Or, you know, if you're gonna build a house, can you build these houses? Yes, but let's add another one so you'll get more out of maybe what you invested in, right? Or maybe something like this, right? So you buy this, but you're like, but I, I have these. So now am I just gonna forget these? No, you don't forget what's in the toy box. So you get creative right? And you're like, Ooh, wait a minute. I have new dyes. I have new shapes. These are kind of cool, which is very interesting to think about how can I mix and match? That's what set my brain into overload, right? I told you already the the ADD was going crazy where all these ideas happened and I needed a way to focus, to think, what could I do when it came to these pieces? So using Zoe's uh, inspiration for uh, how she organized the dies. I needed something a bit more visual. I'm a visual guy, right? I need to, I need to see exactly what those are because the dies themselves, they're awesome, right? I can look at that and go, okay, that's a, that's a, a, a tower. That's going to be, um, I didn't even grab the one panel I'm looking for. Where's the window panel? Did I chuck it off over here? 
you see that die set? There we go, over here, thanks. Right, windows doors. I look at these all the time, but I can't visualize it. So here's what I did. I just went in and created a swatch set of things that the village does, right? What do these dies do for the collection? So I just cut my doorways out of a piece of scrap and I cut it through my tag so I can see, oh, those are, those are my two doorway options. Oh, that's my entryway option. Okay, that's cool, I like that. Oh, that's this doorway option. So that reminds me of like what the doorways look like. And then these are doors and frames. So it's like, okay, so these are my different door options where I can create a solid door. Maybe it's out of wood grain paper, whatever. These, these are different trims, right? Maybe I want these out of metal. Maybe I want these out of a different cardstock. These are my window treatments. These are what the rooftops look like. But the one that mattered most were these. How did these windows and doors open? So all I did for this was take a piece of my sticky grid, take all of my window openings. And as we mentioned, there's a ton of them. And this is also a reminder of the difference between a window and frame. Place them on a sticky grid, just making sure that the sticky grid was all your spacing was the size of your tag, right? So when it's on my sticky grid, I just placed all my dies not to exceed this space. And then I cut my window openings, stuck my tag down, ran it through and cut my window openings in the tag, right? Whatever arrangement you want, okay? Now the window openings, you get multiples of each. I only need one for reference. I didn't need to cut two to know that they both look the same, right? So I just did one of each. Obviously the ovals and circles are one. Then I went in and did my window frames, but I used the trick that I shared last week, which is I went in with my craft, I ran it through my Xyron so it was already sticky, and we ran that through, and then I added a frame to each of those window openings. So visually, I can see my options, right? I can see here uh, what I want to create. I can create that little cross open window. And this has really helped me look at things in more ways, not just so, not a whole inventory thing, right? Not so much like, ooh, I know what I have and it matches. It wasn't that. It was that when I started creating, like when I wanted to create this little gingerbread, I wanted to have some bigger windows because these, well, they're quite small, the additional windows. And these were a little too big, <laughs> like the three bears. This was too big, this is too small. I needed something just right. So I got this out and I'm like, okay, let's, let's take a look at this house. Okay, what's gonna work? Oh, that's a good window. Oh, that, that window will fit. Oh, actually, you know what? That'll fit on the side. And I was able to position what I wanted on the actual house, the wall itself. And then I was like, oh, hey, that little window, that's pretty cute. That's adorable, that's just the size I want. So I use the window and the window frame from the collection with my paper village, right? Because they, it's the same concept. As I mentioned at the, at the start of the whole demo, it's the same concept in the fact that it's giving you this open space to position dies. So these and these are totally interchangeable. If it fits inside that space, you can cut it, right? So that is what I did. I added little side windows from the village collection just because I wanted bigger windows. Now, is this like, oh, that's his way to get you to buy another one? No, no, use what you have, really. But it's nice to know that if you have both, don't just think I'm only getting this out and you forget about all these other options that you have in your space. And that is what reminded me of that, right? The same way we like to make ink swatches because it reminds you of something, having a dye swatch is going to remind me of all of my options that I have. Now, will I probably go back and, and make an option of this? Eh, maybe, the difference on this one though is you don't get the trims, right? This was supposed to be super simple, so you don't have all the, the little decorative trim. So it's really just like a hole is a hole, but I might still do it because I wanna look at it. But then I was inspired by another idea that Paula did during uh, the, the Village release when she did her make. And she I remember her texting me, she's like, you're not gonna believe this, so cool. Like, so when she created these windows, and these are the windows, uh, they're these little square ones, so they come in the Paper Village, she was like, I wanted to find frames that would work with these windows. So this one, and I'm not sure if this is the one you use, Paula, but this is the one I use for this one. This door frame, this little rectangle, was the same size as those little rectangles, a little bit bigger. So I was able to cut two of these, and I just chopped off the top and the bottom, and that's where I got these little window frames were from these. Again, visual. So it gives you that whole little scale 
of how you can you can work with things all right so let's keep going now that you guys understand the little tag thing uh village swatching yeah i just think it's fun and does it take time yes everything else is time but this is a make and it's it's going to make me use my stuff even more that's what it's all about all right so there you go uh, next what we're going to do is take this this craft and i'm going to give you some tips before you get to embellishing it because this is what i learned um, along the way all right when you go to create this craft paper has different looks to it right because it is a, a recycled material it has a, i love this color of craft because i wanted something inkable but because i was going for gingerbread i don't know if the camera is going to pick this up i wanted that little toasty gingerbread look and this didn't have it right so let me share some some tips of what i was able to kind of create with it so first thing i did well the first thing i did was screwed it up four or five times but then what i figured out was after you cut your pieces put on your adhesive and as i mentioned for this particular series it is score tape all the way it's skinny i i do score tape 100 percent for uh, the village it just makes it super easy okay so i'm just going to place that down again put it on those tabs and i want that down first on just the plain paper because i'm going to alter this paper but it's very important that this is down first because what we put down the tape will not stick to it that's what i learned the hard way is i went in and did all my altering and then i'm like oh let me do score tape now you could go in and glue it so if you're not using score tape then just forget all the stuff that I'm sharing with you. But if you're going to use score tape, get the tape on first. Okay. I place it down. And then because I'm going to do stuff to it, I actually just go in with a bone folder, paper creaser. I love this Teflon one. It's my favorite because it doesn't uh, put shine on your paper. Right. A lot of card makers. If you remember that there's, there's different kind of paper creasers or bone folders, not that you need to really know about bone folders or that you care, but this Teflon tool, although it's, it's more costly than the other ones. This doesn't leave shine on your paper. You know, if you use like a plastic bone folder and you, you score the side of your card, you get that little shine on there. This doesn't. And I like the fact that, you know, ink or whatever doesn't stick to it either. So I'm not sure who makes it, but it's, it's a good one. Okay. So once I have that down, we have some options. I want to create, like I said, that little toasty, fresh baked look. Distress ink to the rescue. So let me take out... And you could work with archival if you want to work with it, but I want this to be a little bit more blended. So I'll take my minis that happen to be in my little cart, my little trusty cart. All right. Now, because oh, I just dropped it, there we go. Um, I'm just going to work with this one little color. So it's completely up to you what you, what you do. I always say that I have pork chop fingers. So when I'm working with stuff, I it seems to chase this. So I just took off the lid, put the pad back in there because that's just going to allow me just to to dip into the ink, so to speak, right? And then what I'm going to do is just, but yeah, you could have some type of ink holder, right? Ink stand, anything. There's a lot of great things out there to hold on to your inks for you. This one is just a, a quick way that I'm gonna take domed foam. That's gonna allow me just to go right on the edge. So I'm folding that over and I'm just gonna ink the edges of the cut. This is a little vintage photo. I just like this color. Then on the back, because I know that there's not much there, I'm going to go in a little bit more. The nice thing about a domed foam is it does allow you uh, easy blend without any lines. I'll pick that up again. I'm gonna go, so I fold the paper to go on the edge because I want to cook that edge. I'll go on the bottom. I fold the tabs because the tabs become the corners of things, right? Using the ink. But what a lot of people don't realize is that Distress Ink has a resin in it. Okay, that's what makes it do all its magical things from blending and wicking and doing all of that stuff. And because it has resin, if you've ever put ink down on a card or a surface and you try to put something down with double stick tape over an inked background and it falls off, it's because the resin of distress is not cured on there. You actually have to heat set distress ink to get the resin to dry, but it doesn't smudge or anything, but that's to get the resin to dry. So. If you inked this without putting your tape on first, you would need to go and heat these pieces first. Otherwise your tape wouldn't stick because there would be distress ink down there. And you'd touch it, you'd be like, but the ink is dry, but the resin isn't. So I just like to do that. Same thing like if you're gonna use rub-ons over an inked background or in a journal, you're gonna, 
you're going to need to to make sure that you heat the distress or the distress oxide because they both contain resin all right so let's just go in and do a little inking around the edge here see it just it holds on to that nice for that color and we'll fold that there you go a little bit of that okay one more here all right so next up we're going to talk about icing and adding uh, that frosty little yumminess to gingerbread, right? Because that's the whole thing. If you've not made a gingerbread house, it's, it's done with royal icing that sounds delicious, but is not. It's actually like, I don't know, sugar glue, I guess. Um, but it's a nice, thick little icing uh, that will allow you to build things. Now, I didn't want to use royal icing on a make. I don't want to use uh, food stuff on there because I just wanted to do something crafty. And so what I use is texture paste. Now you may not want to do this. I totally get that. But if you want to use texture paste for your winter makes, here is my advice. You want to start with a fresh jar of texture paste. A fresh jar is going to have the viscosity of like a, like, well, royal icing or like marshmallow fluff, very wet. The longer you have your texture paste, the more it will become thicker, drier, and that's okay. You can still use it with a palette knife and stencils and all that. But for holiday makes, if you're going to do this technique, you're wanting a fresh jar. I'm just telling you that. And even if you're like, oh, but Tim, I'm going to add a little water to mine or I'm going to add that fancy refresher because you can do it. It is going to change the consistency of this and you will not get the same results. But you can do whatever you want to do. This is just what I do. I take a jar and I'm like, this is my seasonal texture paste because now I can ice the world. I can, I can not only ice on gingerbread things, I can put it on cards or tags and I'll show you different tricks. The next thing I do is you go to the dollar store and the dollar store you can buy a cake decorating kit now if you don't have a dollar store uh, you can try this with a bag but more than likely it's going to rip through a ziploc bag okay because this is a thicker thing like royal icing you're going to want to push this out so here is what i'm going to to do i take that little decorating set and i make one and this is how it stays it stays in here for the season uh, so when i'm not using it i roll up the bag in a baby wipe around the tip because the baby wipe is going to keep moisture not only in the bag and on the tip but the cool thing about this is it is it's vinyl so it's a nice heavyweight vinyl it's got interchangeable tips i use the small one i take the entire bag i unroll it i take an entire jar and i fill the bag because i'm going to use it if you're not going to use that much you might not even want to do all this you may want to figure out some other little tip or trick but this gives me a bag of icing for the entire creative season Okay, because we can now pipe this on to the house. The benefit of using texture paste is it looks like icing, but it is going to be flexible, pliable. It's not going to break off like icing would because texture paste has that flexibility. But the challenge of using white paste over an inked surface is that distress ink wants to start wicking through. I just left a little corner undone. Can you see that? And it starts to to yellow or get a weird little color if you forget this one step, which is to seal this. So now that it's inked, I'm going to place this down, push those down again, because I want to seal. Oop, I've got some little tape exposed. Let's get the little piece back on there. There we go. I want to seal this paper, all of my inked things. So I'm going to work with Distress Microglaze. Okay. This is stuff that's great. It seals distress ink. It seals watercolor. It's great for cards. Not only is it going to seal the ink on here, but you're going to see that it's going to change the color of the craft from that really light to kind of that little fresh baked, just the perfect, just going to darken it just a little bit. So I like that. I'm just going to use my finger. Just touch a little bit on there. You don't need, you don't need much. Place this down. And we're literally going to rub that microglaze into the craft paper. We're not sludging it on, we're not spackling it. You are rubbing this into the fibers of the paper. And I'm gonna go around the edges, really make sure that I go over the inked areas. I'll try to see that. Can you see where it doesn't have any glaze yet? See right there, see the difference in color? Yeah, all right. So now I'll just, you don't need a lot. Let it like work from the paper. If your finger is like a slip and slide all over the back of the paper, you have too much on your finger, right? You wanna. You want to hear it and kind of feel it grabbing, grabbing the paper. Then once you're done rubbing that in, you're going to take a dry paper towel and you are going to buff away the excess. Okay. Cause we don't want to leave 
any of that on there. You would do this even if you were doing this on a card. And I'm going away from my tape because I don't want to put this on because this stuff is kind of, it is waxy base, but it actually has a solvent in it. Um, and that's what makes it not react with the Distress Ink. It also is what makes the Distress Ink waterproof, right? So once that's done, it, it makes the Distress permanent. So by sealing it with some microglaze, that is going to help avoid that brown ink seeping up into the white texture paste. Now, if you don't put enough on there, it's inevitable. You might get a little, you know, seepage of color, but that's not, that's not the worst thing. It's not as bad as if you don't do it at all, okay? But I also love the fact that it changes the craft. I love the look of that, of how it just changes the craft paper. So again, just dry paper towel, buff that off. Okay, excellent. One more piece, well, I can do that too, but I probably won't build the whole thing, but I'll just do one more. And I'm just touching it, you can see. See, I'm not even, I'm not scooping anything on there because I just like the fact that a little goes a long way. And that's why when you're not using microglaze, you need to be sure that you put the lid on there. Otherwise it could evaporate. Okay, there we are. I could do that piece, but I'm not gonna build the whole thing yet. So I will get there. All right. So next I wanna make sure this is dry. Dry meaning microglaze, as I mentioned, has a, a solvent in it. So I'm, you could use a hair dryer if you don't have a heat tool. This is not about a specific temperature. It's just making sure that that microglaze is, is permeated into the paper. And I also like the fact that by adding the heat to it, I think it just makes that paper just become that dark color. <laughs> see, you can see the difference, right? It just changes the color. All right, then we build. And build is just like we did before, right? Let's take, oh my heck. There we go, it's my dad pick. Look at this pile over here, Mario. That's crazy, huh? Beautiful. Well, <laughs> well, thanks. Okay, so same thing with score tape. We're just gonna pick that off. We're gonna line this up. All right, making sure that our edges are lined up. There we go. And I like to, I like to see some of that corner. So, but again, you do what's gonna work best for you. Push that down. We're gonna take this other tab. We're gonna peel that off. And th like I said on the other one, it's the same idea for the house, meaning I just round it when I'm trying to line it up. I don't, I'm not worrying about how the paper goes because this is just gonna allow me to see exactly where I want it to be. And then when it's done, remember your house is going to be squared. So I can push both sides of it just to make sure that everything is, is lined up that way. All right, then we're gonna fold these in. There's our little tabs and you can build the roof that way. If you don't want to use score tape on the roof and you're like, hey, I love that hot glue idea, go for it, hot glue it. You do whatever whatever works. And sometimes, when even when I use score tape, um, it just doesn't want to stick for whatever reason. So then I'll go back in with hot glue, right? Just because I'll need to mend it or maybe I'll use some collage medium. So I'm just going to position that. I'm just looking at my roof line because remember this can go flush to the back if you're going to glue it onto a card or a panel or it can go to the front, whatever is gonna work uh, best for you. And then once you do that, you're just gonna, I'm gonna adjust it. Why is it that like putting stuff on your on your belly is like the best leverage? I don't know why that is. <laughs> it is. I, every time I wanna, I wanna hold something, like I just wanna, like I could totally use it on the table, but no, instead I'm gonna just, you know, get six chins while I'm looking down, trying to position this on, on my belly. It's just what I do. All right. But now you got a little house, right? Simple, cute. You saw how quick that one went together. Tape, tape, doom, doom, done, okay? This, these little, these little gingerbread shingles, well, those are, went through my little swatch. I'm like, oh, hey, those look like, that's great little gingerbread, right? A haunted house, it looked really cool out of sandpaper. But for the gingerbread, I think that's gonna be good. I did the exact same treatment on that, which is cut them out of craft, did a little inking of the edge, did a little microglaze because I didn't want it to wick through. The only difference on this one, because I wanted these to look kind of dusted in powdered sugar, I went in and used Distress Paint on a blending tool and I just kind of went around the edges with some white paint just to create that, that powdered sugar look, All right? But then what we're gonna do, you'll get the idea, we would cut out the window frames out of white. That's just white cardstock with that's been Zyroned. So I had those little, those little gingerbread things and then we'll go in and do our icing. Now, I'm not the best. I don't 
I don't bake or do anything, so I have a good time with it, but this is very forgiving, okay? So you're just gonna get, a, get this going, All right? There you go, see, there's our little bead. And you're gonna start however you wanna do it. If you wanna go like under the, under the eaves, you're just gonna push that in there and squeeze and just give yourself that perfect movement, right? And then that dismount. I love the break that it gives because to me, it's just kind of like icing. But let's say I'm just gonna go crazy and just not do a good job. Right, so let's just say you kind of did that and you're like, oh, that's not good. The cool part about this is it's very forgiving. You can take this off while it's wet. You can even go in with a craft pick and you can do any kind of cleaning and you can get a do-over. So don't panic on this. You also want to make sure that when you're doing this, that this stuff is wet enough that when you're, when you're applying it, you are pushing it. Am I even in camera? No. No, you are. Yeah you're pushing this onto the edge. Can you guys see that? Right, I want this to stick. I even go in with my finger sometime and I'll just kind of touch that down just to make sure you have contact with it. Now, if you want this to be a little bit smoother, no problem, you just have to keep, well, I'll show you, because normally really I'm like an inch away from my face, but you just have to keep a smooth movement. It's just like when you're doing icing, you just keep moving instead of stopping and keep that pressure going. Right. But I like the fact, I mean, you'll see on my house, I intentionally, no surprise there. I like the fact that I'll like stop a little bit and pick it up and start and then I'll make it thinner and then I'll make it thicker because that's how I made it as a kid. But again, you do you. If you don't like that, just lift it off with your finger and create that. It's fun. It does take some practice. And hey, if you guys have any other hacks or tips for something other than texture paste that you found works, I'm all open to that. Um, I just know that I didn't want to use well, actual food. I didn't want to use sugar or icing, but that paste did a, a good job. So maybe you come up with some sort of crazy concoction with, you know, school glue or something, but it's just a lot of fun. And then I let that dry and then I'll just take a little splatter brush and splatter some white paint. I think I had, there we go. It's in my, it's in my sparkle station, right? Remember I told you about the sparkle station? That's where my splatter stuff is too. It's kind of the messy stuff, but a little bit of white distress paint a distress splatter brush in my splat box. So yes, I did. I, there's my splat box. He's got just a little snow in there from doing that. But you just splatter it on with some white paint and it's charming. I love the idea of using the ideology confections. So if you wanted to add some candy, you can find a lot of things. You can make stuff, you can buy miniatures, but uh, ideology, we did these confections. I love these, but I liked mine to have a little bit more sparkle. So you can see that there you go, see that little sparkle on there? That's just a little bit of glossy accents and some rock candy glitter, but I definitely prefer the sparkly candies versus just the plain, but you could do it that way. But I, I just took a little sparkly candy, so let's just take that one. And to add it to my house, it's just like doing this as a kid, right? Oh, spackle, someone just said spackle, that could work. Spackle could totally work. I didn't even think about that. As long as it's fluid enough, so you see how I like put a big blob, just like as a kid, I want it to be messy. So I'm gonna take that and I'm gonna just squish it. Yeah, you even make that sound when you do it. Cause I love that. Cause that to me was the whole thing of a kid. You know, you just put on so much icing just to stick down a, like a single jelly bean or a lifesaver. But that would, that's gonna work as the glue. It's gonna hold that on there as well. Just something cute and fun to do. That's what the making season is all about. It's just so, you can go in and do really fun things. Would it be easier to ice flat before constructing it? I'm not sure how you're gonna fold icing. That's the only thing that I don't think is, is really gonna work too well. And I'm, I'm not sure how you're gonna get the icing to, to stick in there. But hey, if it's easier for you to, to do that flat, go for it. I, I just like the idea that it's going to really look like, well, how you build the, the gingerbread house, right? And you can light these up. I mean, there's a lot of things that you can put inside the window. You can use tiny lights. Another thing, if you have any kind of, you can buy battery operated tea lights. You can take your favorite Sizzix dies and make a cool greenery wreath, or you can find uh, smaller wreaths or anything. But these are great because you could take a little tea light, stick that on top, right? And if this was all decorated, these would be cool for a tabletop. Or if you were gonna just do this on the tree, you can either put a light inside or maybe you want to use one of the circle windows, right? Because, hey, we can size it to our Christmas lights, make sure your Christmas light fits in there, but then cut a, a circle in the back of this and actually glue a bottom 
And if you're going to put these in the tree, you can have just a, a Christmas light pop through the back as your light source. So there's many ways besides just tiny lights that you can go in and light this up. So it's really good. Did I add rock candy to the whole house? No, you could. Um, but the gingerbread house, I wanted to have that gingerbready look. So the only thing sparkly, see, is that little candy. But all of this is splattered. So that's just the white distress paint, right? And then that's just some film. You can take, uh, you can take any of your dye storage envelopes or any of this kind of plastic, and you can cut this up. And that's what I used as the windows. So that's why the windows just look frosty. You can use mica, you can use a lot of things. Um, but if you have any extra envelopes or if you have ideology frosted, which was years ago, but this makes really good, good window stuff because the frosty finish of it, it just diffuses it. So I just cut a little piece, put my, my tape, and then when I'm building it, there you can see inside. I have just a little panel of that stuff stuck on the inside because I like how it diffuses the light. So it's really up to you um, how you want to, to create that. It's really cute. Yeah. Yeah, I think it'd be great for holiday dinner, especially if you just light it up. And you can, you can do a lot of things with a tea light. You can do a, a wreath. You can even just take your favorite washi tape and just cover it just so it's just sitting there. And you can put someone's name and then they can do what they want with the, the light or you can keep the tea light. But yeah, a lot of ideas. That to me is, is what this was all about, was creating ideas of, of what to do, what to do with the village. There's so many different ways that, that we can take the, the paper village. You can take your village collection. You can make little mini guys. You can make little log cabins. You can make ones that are uh, out of pattern paper or layers. There's so many different ideas of, of what you can create, but it is important when you're doing this to get yourself set up, like with everything else, get organized, do this in kind of compartmental ways. And more than anything, just kind of give yourself permission to figure it out, right? Give yourself permission to play around and, and answer that, you know, what if, could I do this? This would be fun. Let me, let me try this. You don't have to all go all in, but to make this, I would say from start to finish, this guy was probably uh, about 30 minutes. It doesn't take long when you have all the pieces done. The figuring out part took me uh, more than that, probably a day because, you know, I made one and then I forgot that, you know, the microglaze in the distress wasn't working well with the tape. So I tried to wipe it off. That didn't work. I started over it just on and on. And then, you know, I forgot about sealing that ink and then all the icing turned brown. Well, it could be chocolate icing, but it wasn't that wasn't see you can see it's not a nice looking brown it's just kind of weird but i didn't mind it in some spots i just didn't want the whole thing like that but there again maybe if you don't ink it you don't have to worry about either one of those steps so you definitely have creative options right 